All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Know Your Gear QA number 168. Uh, and I hope you guys had a great weekend. Uh, our week. I should say week. We're going to have a great weekend. We just had a great week. I feel like this week was a weekend in the fact that it was super, super short. I, I don't think I got to about half the things I was supposed to do this week. It's probably the least productive week I've had in a long time. And it feels like I threw all the horsepower and effort I could behind it and still got nowhere. But we're going to start the stream with a couple of cool things. First, if you're new to this live show every Friday, just keep in mind if you're watching live and you want to ask a question or start a subject, put a question mark first. That lets me know you're talking to me. Also, uh, whatever, if you're watching the, uh, whenever you're watching the rebroadcast, uh, I time uh, stamp all the subjects and, and questions we talk about. So you can go to that. And of course, if you just want to listen to this, you can stream it as a podcast on iTunes and uh, iHeartRadio and SoundCloud and all that other stuff. So there you go. Try that. Now, to start with a couple things, this is uh, essentially my bir birthday weekend. And I want to tell you what I got myself for my birthday. Uh, it's behind me. It just came. It literally just came now. So you, you, this is it. <laughs> so what did I get? Well, I got a uh, limited edition Princeton 68 Princeton, my favorite amp. As you guys know, anybody watching the channel for a long time know I love my 68 Princeton with a 10-inch speaker. They did a limited rush. Uh, limited, they did a limited edition FSR run, Fender Special Run. I think of 40 of these. Now there's surf green ones out there, and they're basically the same thing. But this is. Uh, it's essentially, I think they're calling it turquoise, right? It's not Daphne blue. It's, I would say it's more seafoam green than surf green for sure, but it's even more turquoise than seafoam green. So what is it? It's just a 68 uh, Princeton, exactly like they sell every day of the week, but with a special, uh, a special, um, uh, I'll say seafoam green turquoise uh, uh, vinyl and a uh, beautiful wheat colored grill and a 12 inch speaker this has the 12 and not the 10 and it's a greenback celestion so i'm very curious about it what was really interesting was i think it fell victim to the nam show summer nam show what i mean by that is there was no mention of it out there in the out there it just seems like it was off the radar i came across one on reverb and uh it was awesome it's a hundred dollars more than the standard one which i mean the speaker is worth you know, a hundred bucks. And then having the cool custom color, it's got the FSR. Oh, I can spin it, let me show you. I don't know if you'll see it in this video, but it's got the cool limited edition badge on the back. You can see I haven't done anything. There's the greenback selection. I'm sure it's the, as I look, it doesn't say proudly. So I'm gonna say it's made in China, not the English one, but uh, don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Still a cool amp. I put it here so you guys could see it. I'm pretty stoked about it. I'm going to compare it to my uh, other Princeton and see what I think about it. It was really cool. And a uh, little side note, uh, I bought it from, I want to get this right. I want to say Eddie's Music. Please hold tight. Let me look. I have to go into my reverb uh, settings or reverb history under purchases. I was struggling with deciding if I was going to buy one for a little while, and then I did it. And... Oh man, it is Eddie's. Eddie's music. I'm going to try it. I just want to get it right, guys. Hold on a second. Please, please keep in mind that I have to. I should have been prepared for this. I should have had it all ready to go, and I didn't. I'm not logged into my account. Let me go to it under purchases because I want to give them a shout out because they got it to me fast. I can't even find it. <laughs> oh! I know why. See, I followed my own advice. <laughs> I didn't buy off Reverb. Uh, so what happened was this uh, amp was on Reverb, uh, and I uh, did exactly what I told you guys to do last week, or said you could do. I shouldn't say I told you to do so, but I said you could do this. I went to uh, their website, and I bought it straight from them. Uh, so it's Eddie's Music. Um, let me, that's the, that's the, I'll put a link. How about that? I'll just put a link to their website. A uh, little cool little store, bought it direct from them. Uh, they didn't have to pay any reverb fees. Not that that was the in intent of the entire goal of that. But again, like I told you guys, you can save the mom and pop a little money if you buy it direct from them. And uh, also uh, buying it direct, they didn't charge any shipping or sales tax. It just came straight. So it was a flat rate. I paid the flat uh, rate amount. So that was pretty cool too. Always nice to save a little money, especially on the shipping and stuff. Um, and uh, so very excited about that. Uh, so I thought I'd share that with you. I uh, hope this works out. I kind of bought it on a whim. Not a whim like I've been wanting one, but I've been a whim like 
uh, I'm not sure if it's going to work out the way I want. So I'm excited. Okay, uh, I have some pinned questions, and uh, let's get to those. So let's talk about some actual stuff you probably want to talk about instead of my amp that I'm excited about. Hold on, wait, before we do that, I want to get to anyone talking about the amp questions, thoughts. Somebody said something about speaker, what I thought of the speaker. Um, all right, we'll just get to the first questions. Now, I have some super chat questions. I will definitely get to them, but I want to get to the, some of the questions I pinned. As you guys know, I try to pin the first question or at least the first couple questions on the show. Since you guys come early and hang out before I'm here, I really appreciate you doing that. Uh, and the first one's from Derek, and he says, Phil. Hey, Phil, love the channel. I have a PRS S2. S2 is for Stevensville, too. It's the American-made PRS, but it's the uh, the lower price line. It's one of my favorite of the lines. Uh, it says, uh, where, okay, so he's saying he's got a PRS S2 where the finish looks like it's bubbling. Uh, nothing is flaked off. Um, but I have read stories on the web about this. How concerned should I be? Now, this is one of those moments where I'm not into sports, but maybe I can identify with someone when their team just, uh, drops the ball, literally, right? Uh, and uh, like I have friends that are into sports, of course, and they're like, you know, it's, they seem to get so much great joy for when the other team just really drops it, right? And messes up. Uh, this is one of those moments there. If you're not a PRS fan, you're going to love this, uh, uh, hearing this. Uh, so, you know, hey, you know, especially if you're a Gibson fan and you're sick of every bash in Gibson, there's a bash back for PRS for you. So what you're talking about is this. Let me show you. Funny enough, I, let me, if I can get to it. Hold on. Excuse me, I have to pull one off the rack. This is one of my favorite guitars. This is my Paul Reed Smith, <laughs> with no trust rod as always, uh, cover. Uh, PRS S2, this is, it, it looks like it's black. It's actually a trans black finish, but you can't see it, it's too dark. And on this one, I don't know if it'll come up, but I have exactly what you're talking about. Um, I can't, I don't think, is it right there a little bit? You see that little white line right there? And then there's probably another one Hold on, let me find it right here. Oh, right there above my finger. See that milky little line right there above my finger? It's hard to see with this camera. Um, yes, so to answer your question, hold on, let me hang that back. To answer your question, yes, uh, PRS are known for the finish bubbling off or lifting off the, the guitar. Excuse me, I gotta drink water. I apologize. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it does happen. In fact, I, I, if you guys haven't heard, starting this year, all PRS guitars are now nitrocellulose lacquer. Uh, all of them. S2s, core. I mean, not the SEs, but anything made in the Stevensville factory. Um, I don't know the reasoning behind why that is the case. Uh, I am doing a podcast with uh, Jack, the COO of PRS next week. And I don't know when that'll be out to you guys, but I have questions and we'll talk about that. I'm sure, I'm sure they'll come up with what the change is about, but yes. So in other words, what I'm telling you is there are known, even the cores for knowing for bubbling off. Um, and so to answer your question, should you be concerned? Yeah, you have to have that fixed buddy. Um, it might be under warranty. So you might want to reach out to PRS. Uh, they fix it. If I recall, uh, they fix it by basically injecting probably super glue in it and gluing it back against the body, as silly as that is. Um, but yeah, it has to be fixed. It will eventually keep lifting and flake off. Not all PRSs do it, but some do. And it's been, a, it's been an issue for a while now. And again, I'm not saying because of that issue, they're going to nitro lacquer. What I'm saying is they are going to nitro lacquer. So I don't think that problem is going to be an issue anymore. But it's something in the past that I've experienced um, on a core guitar or two. Especially what's really, what I've learned is mine is coming off because again, you can tell what happened was just the, the dry climate I live in, the probably what happened was the next shrank over time. I mean, this guitar I've had for five years or four years, four years. Uh, and that just happened in the last probably six months. I'm sorry, guys. My throat is really going dry. <coughs> mm, should have uh, should have had a lozenge. Uh, so anyways, uh, what was I going to say? Um Back to the PRS issue. Uh, so you have to have it fixed because like I said, it will continue to flake off or bubble and get worse. So you can have it fixed. The good news is you can have it fixed and it should be under warranty for the most part. But again, I can't guarantee that because I don't know if you bought it new, used when you had it, but either way, definitely get it addressed. All right, let's go to the next one. I hope that kind of covers it. Uh, the next one is always rocking 2009. 
He says, anyone using the Line 6 Pod Go or a more GE250? I have a more GE250. I have a more GE300, and I now have in possession the new more GE300 Lite, which I'm most excited about. I don't know. I might have to get a loss in Hold on. <clears throat> My allergies have been killing me because uh, this is monsoon season. And for those of you guys who don't know, I'm in Arizona. This is when all the, we actually have moisture in the air now and there's stuff in the air. So, okay. So anyways, uh, back to the, uh, the uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah, the, the pod go. Uh, so I like the GE 300 way better than the 250, but there's such a price increase. That's crazy. I'm hoping that the 300 light is going to be really cool. I haven't tried it. Uh, really like the pod go. I've tried one and I really liked it. Uh, just recently played one a couple days ago. And um, I really, really, really like it. And hold on a second. I'm going to have to get a lozenge. I'm sorry, guys. Hold on. All right, I'm back, and I have some of these um, Ricolas. <laughs> so, again, the show must go on. Sometimes you just got to work around stuff. Okay, so uh, back to Podgo. Podgo is really cool. If it was me, I would pick the Podgo over the GE250, but the the uh, the I'm, the uh, the jury's still out out on the GE300 Lite. I'm really really interested to see how they compare. Maybe that'd be a cool video to compare those two. I really wanted to compare the GE300 Lite by more against the Helix Stomp since they're almost in the price, same price point. Okay, next we have some Super Chats. Let's hit those and hope that I keep my voice. <laughs> All right, uh, next we have, first I should say, first, first Super Chat of the day comes from, I have no idea, Soy Dimitris, something. <laughs> he says, hey, Phil, I'm debating where to buy, uh, basically he's debating if he should buy a Schecter C1 SLS. SLS means that it's the slimmer neck of the Schecter guitar. So Schecter guitars has, to me, has a C-shaped, uh, <laughs> it's like I'm going to have all these weird she sounds as I have this lozenge. Anyways, uh, has a C-shaped uh, neck profile that I like. The SLS is uh, is a thinner neck. It's not thin like Ibanez, but definitely thin, very thin. He wants to know what I think about the C1 SLS, which is the thin neck uh, Schecter Elite, or should he get the Char uh, Charvel Pro Mod DK24HH? Any thoughts and recommendations? Man, it's tough, man. Those are two guitars that I both really, really, really like. Um, to me, there's not a quality difference in those two guitars. Like I couldn't say like, oh yeah, definitely get this for the quality versus that. I think this what's great about this, the two guitars you're picking. And, and to me, if I was in a shop trying these two guitars out, it would just be which one do I prefer the sound of and how it plays a little better. I will tell you this. Um, I'm trying to think. I, I think the Schecter has maybe just by a, maybe a thinner neck. But I mean, so you know, they're so close. They're about the same neck. Uh, the way the thickness, the thickness, both have thin necks. So I would say it, it depends on what, if you want to get something a little bit more modern versus a little something more traditional. The Char Charvel would be more traditional, old school, and the uh, Schecter would be more modern. It's tough. Both are very good guitars. I don't know which one to pick. I'm sure somebody's going to put comments in down below which one to do. Um, I don't know. I don't have an answer, man. I can tell you this. I don't think you can go wrong either way. Both two guitars, I would definitely put in my some of my favorite instruments, especially for the price points. They're not inexpensive by any means, but I think they're way better than some of the competitors at much higher prices. All right, Bill says, Bill says, uh, what's the status of the guitar build-off project? Question mark, Texas Toast looks like they're bringing it. Nice amp. Uh, I haven't even opened it yet. I, th I thought it was, uh, I think they said September, right? Like I said, I don't plan to try, I'm, I, my goal is not to put any more than two to three days into this as a project. Because again, it's it's uh, 
you know, <laughs> it's a charity build, which I love to do because obviously I want to want to put some uh, some money into Guitars for Vets uh, 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 pockets. Uh, but obviously, like I said, two to three days, I mean, that's tough. So it's basically like how I look at it is it's giving up one of my weekends, you know, so my weekends are my personal time. Giving up a weekend is something I, I don't have a problem obviously doing, but then it's like giving up another day, of wor a work day. So, um, and in my world, there's no such thing as vacation or sick days. If I don't work, I don't get paid. And that's how it's been for w almost two decades now. So, so uh, yeah, that's my plan. Uh, but like I said, I'll probably open it, I'll probably open the box. I don't know. I said maybe this week, but there was just no way. There was just no way. The, uh, in fact, there's no way next week either. Again, my schedule is almost entirely locked up next week. Um, so, uh, but definitely my plan is in August to do it. Let's see. What else? Uh, and then, like I said, I'll be releasing a video at the end when I'm done. So it's mine's just a one video where I'll, it'll be like a start to finish showing you everything I did from when I unboxed it to when I finished it, showing you where I'm at with that. Um, let's see. Sparkle Tune <laughs> official. Sparkle Tune official says, first time listener, happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you think Fender will ever do a Strat Plus Deluxe and Ultra Lace sensors? No, no. So the question was, what you know, do I, do I, do I, do I think you're asking, do I think, do I think Fender will ever just put lace sensors in anything again? No, don't think so. As far as I know, there's no bad blood between those two companies. I don't know if there is or isn't. I've never heard anything, but, um, no, I think Fender has decided or did decide, I should say at, at some point to put their, uh, R and D in their pickup development. You have to understand a pickup is a very high margin product. Uh, it's, it's one of the few, like there's, there's a couple, couple things in our industry that literally demand high, uh, margins, uh, guitar cables, right? Which cables are universal. All cables have good margin for most industries, you know, but guitar cables, you know, are, are kind of cables, uh, tuners have good margin. You know what I mean? You, you know, obviously I can't, you know, speak to exactly what a tuner clip on tuner makes, but I can imagine, um, you know, it's a, it's a thing that probably costs like a buck or a buck and a half to make and eventually costs 20 bucks when it's done. There's just things like that. There's very few things that are like that in this industry. And um, guitar pickups are another thing that has a high margin when you look at it at material cost. Now, again, you could say R&D and development. Of course, one thing about R&D and development in this industry is there's always some kind of weird, like, man, we spent 10 years developing this. I'm like, yeah, well, NASA spent 10 years getting to the moon. So I don't, you know, I'm, I mean, I don't know how to equate that to a cost. You you made a Strat copy. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how much we're supposed to, you know, understand what's the entire development cost of this. So I'm not saying there's not R&D cost. There is, and it, it, it's real. But what I'm saying is, uh, what I'm trying to get at is this. It is a lot cheaper to make your own pickups than use somebody else's pickups. If you're using anybody else's pickups, you have to pay, uh, obviously their cost to make the pickup plus the margin they want to make. So you can really cut your margin down if you make your own pickups. What you're noticing, what I've noticed, what I've noticed in the last 15 years, and I could say 20, but we'll say 15. In the last 15 years in guitar manufacturing, the thing that I think I've noticed the most is if your instrument is, uh, if you're trying to promote or sell, if you're trying to sell your instrument, you put name brand components on it. So give an example of that is, you know, we see it all the time. There's an inexpensive guitar. It's a $300 guitar. Obviously there's skepticism when you're talking about inexpensive $100, $200, $300 guitars. And some of you guys, I know when I say inexpensive, you understand I'm always talking comparatively to the other guitars, right? So uh, obviously if there's guitars that are $3,000, $300 is on the, on the lower end of the spectrum, 3,000 being on the higher spectrum, and then there's something in the middle. My point to this whole thing is, is that a lot of times to sell that guitar, you put name brand components like pickups in it, and that adds value to the sale. So if somebody goes, man, it's a, uh, it's $500 and it comes with Seymour Duncan pickups that, that has value. However, to manufacturers that are selling guitars without that, in other words, they don't need you to go, Hey, it's a Strat and it comes with Seymour Duncan's Fender doesn't need that. So Fender will just pretty much market their own pickups at this point is what I've noticed. Uh, 
gone are the days where you used to see a lot of aftermarket components on the fender stuff they just don't need it you don't see uh, gibson doing it either uh you don't even see prs doing it and and you don't see sir doing it they're going to develop their own pickups again it's not that their pickups that I, are not great some of them might actually be better than these aftermarket pickups but what i'm saying is there was a time and and there still is a time where guitar manufacturers will use uh, brand name pickups and components to sell the guitar and in fender's case they don't need to right no one's buying a fender guitar because it has lace pickups in it or seymour duncan's or dimargios that's not what's driving the sale price of fender not to the average consumer again if you're like hey man but i care well that's you we're talking about again we're going to talk about the bulk of the consumers so i don't think it's ever going to happen i don't think fender will ever incur that cost uh unless of course it's some kind of anniversary thing what i'd like to see is yeah, the Strat Plus come back as a reissue with lace sensors. Fender, if they were to do that, my guess would be uh, maybe they'll do it as a limited edition run. See, I got a feeling that if Fender did it, they would probably uh, either do it as a limited edition custom shop run or a limited edition run, or they might do it as a made in Mexico production again so that it could be like $1,000 and have lace sensors, but it'd be made in Mexico, something like that. What I learned, and again, I apologize for my lozenge, uh, what I learned talking to a lot of these companies is it's a need thing. If they need to sell something, they'll do it. If they don't, they just you know, kind of do what they're going to do anyways. And Fender is never a, man, if we could just figure out how to sell more guitars next week, they sell guitars. Okay, I want to do a non-super chat or a couple non-super chats to see what you guys are talking about. Uh, there's basically almost 800 of us here. Um... Ah, Suspicious Scissors says, does anyone here wash strings? I wash my strings. Um, I do. Uh, I don't have it here. I was going to reach over to it, and my toolbox is not there. It's downstairs. Um, now I'm using the uh, the Music Nomad string thing that I used when I did the demonstration, all the Music Nomad stuff. It's a string cleaner. Uh, I use that. I was using uh, the Daddario one before that. And uh, I used to use uh, some of the other string cleaners. Here's why I use the string cleaners, believe it or not. And a lot of you guys know you can just use, you know, all kinds of other stuff to clean strings. But I use string cleaners, and there's a reason why. I don't like uh, the black, uh, I want to say soot. It's not soot. What is it? It's the micro, it's just all the metal flakes. So when you play strings, uh, sometimes it comes from the fretboard, sometimes. So when you're playing your guitar and your fingers are all, black and dirty sometimes that's from the rosewood fretboard um but a lot of times it's just from the strings so i make sure when i put new strings on the first thing i do is wipe them down now i don't clean my strings after that it's always the first uh, initial thing uh there's two things i don't do oh my god this is gonna suck because uh, i know half you guys are gonna be like great and the other half are just gonna react wrong to this but it's i got I, you know i try to be upfront about everything uh there's two things i do when it comes to strings one when I put on my strings, and I only use two brands of strings for the most part, I use uh, String Joy strings that I really like those guys, and I use their strings, and I use Daddario, uh, and I like those guys, and I like those strings. If you guys use different strings, I, it's not because I don't like other strings, I just, those are my two brands I like. Uh, I will wipe down those strings the first time I use them with a kind of string cleaner, and now I'm using, like I said, that Music Nomad stuff that I like. Um, however, <laughs> when I get guitars new, I always change the strings, and the reason is, is because whether the guitar is imported or it's an American guitar, uh, usually they're going to use the cheapest strings they can. In fact, um, some of the biggest culprits of that are actually Fender. And again, I'm a very pro Fender guy, right? I mean, I like Fender. So, uh, but being pro Fender doesn't mean I'm naive. So Fender, even though Fender has its own brand of strings that are made by Daddario. So if you ever see Fender strings now in the market, they're made uh, by Daddario. They don't actually put those on the American strats and telly. So if you get a brand new uh, Fender guitar right now, American made, uh, the strings on there are not uh, those those Daddario packs. I don't know what they are, um, but I but I basically just go ahead and assume they're going to use the cheapest strings. And I don't like to buy. I don't like to use really cheap strings that I don't know where they come from. And here's why: it's 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 a uh, it's important because I got to tell you the reason, the psychological issue that happened to me. Um, I was once hanging out at the shop, and some uh, some family came in and brought in a SpongeBob SquarePants guitar, a little acoustic guitar that they got at like Walmart or Target. And uh, it's just, you know, Walmart or Target. And it has these um, little plastic like Tupperware lids that go over the tuning keys. Now, uh, they wanted a guitar restring, no big deal. 
And uh, <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'll restring the guitar. And basically, I, I could say this because he's no longer at Fender, but he was somebody important to Fender. <laughs> and he was standing there and I said, hey, you know what? You, you know what? Did you see this? And he's like, what? And I said, yeah, these little caps that go over the tuning keys that stop you from poking your fingers on the tuning keys, you know, especially since the kid's guitar. You guys should do that. And he says, yeah, well, you know what that's for? And I said, yeah, it's so they don't poke their hands. And he goes, no, it's so they don't share drug needles with a third world country because no one knows where that guitar came from and what strings are on there and where it was made. And, you know, obviously you don't want to do that. Now, I'm not saying that's true what he said. <laughs> he, he did say it. But what happened was it got me thinking like, yeah, I would really like to know, not that I'm really overly concerned with that. What I'm really concerned with is I'd like to know when I'm playing a guitar, where the hell the strings came from, uh, what manufacturer. So it's a habit to me to do th two things is what I'm basically telling you. Change my strings when I first get a guitar and also uh, clean them the first time. So that's why I do that. I'm not suggesting you have to do that by any means, but I got to tell you the truth, which is what I do and why I do it. So I'm just telling you that because it's a good, it's a guitar channel and I'm sure you guys are curious. Um, he said that, I don't know if I ever really buy into that heavy, but it did really get me like weirded out thinking, yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? That is kind of weird. All right. By the way, I still think the Tupperware of the tuning keys is a great idea for kids. Uh, if you guys know what I'm talking about, maybe I'll put a link to one of those guitars on the index. Uh, next, we're going to go to Matt Wells. Oh, cool. Easy. Matt. <laughs> Matt Wells it says, hey, Phil, happy birthday. Thank you. It, uh, technically, I think my birthday is Monday. I should know that, right? It is Monday. Okay. Uh, it says, happy birthday. I've been wanting to uh, rebuy the TS9. We all know your pain, man. So he said rebuy, not buy. We all know the rebuy, right? Yep. Okay. So he wants to rebuy the TS9 I sold a while ago. Yep. Do you know if there's any difference sonically between the new and the vintage ones that would make going vintage worth it? I have... I have dove down the tube screamer rabbit hole at one point in my life chasing for the elusive magical tube screamer that is somehow going to be more different than the others what i can tell you is for me this is how that 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 rabbit hole went the more i went and checked out more tube screamers the more i realized how amazing the magical higher priced magical ones were like man that's really good and then at some point in that deep dive you come back full circle to go well, I guess I don't even care anymore. I have decided now, for some reason, I have about... I'm looking at... I don't have any up on the walls right now because they're probably on my boards. I have four, four or five tube screamers of different iterations. The 808, the TS9, uh, a Maxon version. I have the Ibanez version. I probably have somebody's version of it too. I don't even care anymore. <laughs> what I did was when you AB tube screamers, you go, oh, this one's better than that one for sure. But when you don't AB them and you plug one on, you don't go, oh, this sounds horrible. If I could just find a tube screamer, it doesn't sound like this. Uh, it's not that way. So what I'm basically saying is I don't worry about it. One of the things that I think about all the time that's really funny is this. When it comes to tube screamers, it's kind of funny. The TS9 by Ibanez is $99 new. I bought mine for $60 or $65 used at a guitar center a couple years ago. TS9 new is $99 and it's made in Japan, uh, which is you know, I don't know. It's good because it's where they used to make it. Uh, I had somebody come up to me just a couple months ago and saying, I got an actual tube screamer made in Japan. I'm like, they still make them in Japan. They go, no, they're made in China now. And I'm like, no, they're still made in Japan. Um, so that's good. Uh, if somebody in the comments is going to tell you that they have some magical uh, hand-wired tube screamer that's awesome, they're not wrong. They're not wrong. Um, and to be honest, see, Bill Spruce just mentioned the JHS Bonsai. I had talked about this many, many months ago, uh, and Bill, thank you for bringing that up. I had said this, and I should see. That's why sometimes you got to think. Hey, it's nice you guys have your nice to have you guys in this conversation. Uh, I had mentioned that if I didn't have all these tube screamers, I would buy a JHS bonsai. I, so there you go. That's my advice. I'd buy that pedal. That thing's perfect, <laughs> right? Get that. I can tell you right now. I might do it. I just don't feel it really. I don't really feel a compulsion to sell all my, my my tube screamers to buy the JHS Bonsai. To me, it's more work than it's probably going to be worth. But uh, I, like I said, if I didn't have any tube screamers, I would definitely have the JHS Bonsai and call it a day. That's absolutely true. I, I, I know that for a fact. Um, <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, see, Highway to, Highway to Hell, <laughs> Highway to Hell, 96792. I don't know if that's the right 967. It's like a zip code, 96792. Says, uh, Digitech Bad Monkey is better than uh, than that option. Yeah, of course, there's lots of great pedals. Um, and that's why I said it's it's tough. To me, uh, to me, my issue with the TS9 or TS808, either one, I really don't, I, to me, they're, I have both, and I just literally could care less which one I grab. Uh, a lot of times when I use them, uh, it's transcended over the years from just me liking them because I do like them to literally just going, okay, this will, the audience will relate when I do the video, if I use this, you know what I mean? If I use some other weird brand thing I have, uh, they won't, they won't understand where the sound, what the sound is. They don't have a reference of it. So yeah, they're all good. They make so many, like I said, all the tube screamer copies. I mean, here, here's the thing. There are cheap $20 tube screamer copies that I think are fantastic. So, again, I'm going to continually apologize for my lozenge. But it worked. It did a good job. It did its job. All right. Um, music Therapy says, happy birthday. See, everybody's just going to say happy birthday. That's kind of cool. So we, <laughs> says, uh, going to build you a custom, wait, going to build you a custom sound trap design guitar hanger for your beer caster soon. Hope you like leather. Oh no. Oh no. Uh, never want to, never want to end a sentence with, I hope you like leather. I don't know why. I just think that's not the best way to end any sentence, but I do appreciate that. It sounds really cool. I'm excited. That sounds cool. And I still like it, even though it says, hope you like leather. <laughs> Could you imagine in any sentence you want this weekend for you guys watching the show, wanting to have fun in any sentence this weekend with, I hope you like leather. Hey, you want to go to target? I hope you like leather. <laughs> Thinking about getting a strat. I hope you like leather. I hope music therapy. You're having fun with this. Cause I'm having fun with it too. I love it, man. I appreciate it. I'm curious. I don't know what you're talking about, but I'm curious about what you're talking about. Uh, Grumpy Mike. Hey, Grumpy Mike says, and why not? Uh, your birthday. Happy birthday to you. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate that. Usually it's kind of sucks. This birthday, I've been having a better birthday than normal birthdays because my wife's really into her birthday and I'm not into my birthday. And that's always worked out for us because, you know, my birthday likes to, my, my, my wife likes to spend, have a birthday month. She likes to have a whole month for her birthday. She's very into it. My wife got, uh, screwed over this year her birthday is in march and in fact so you know the state of arizona locked down on her birthday the state of arizona march 13th the state locked down for covid on her birthday so her birthday was a horrible month in fact so you know her birthday was she went to napa valley in california on a wine wine tasting trip with her mom and her uh her aunt and, and cousin and like a reunion they hadn't seen each other in years and they went on this whole trip and then literally the state got shut down and they had to fly emergency home back and then her mom had to stay with us for quarantine for like two weeks um because you know they were at the at, at, at so it was a horrible it was like they were at the airport and all this stuff and so i think my birthday has been a little more than normal like more exciting because my wife's been putting more effort into it i think because you know kind of think we you know kind of I don't know. I think I get the dividend of it. I kind of feel guilty, but it's also kind of nice. Uh, BK. Hey, BK. How's it going? It says best PAF sounding pickup. Oh, whoa. No, I, I guessed and I was wrong. He's saying best PAF sounding single coil size humbucker for jazz blues. Ooh, I tried a bunch. Would love to hear your opinion. That is good because I have no idea. None. None. <laughs> I have never really even thought to kind of put energy into that uh, in the idea of trying out different single coils humbuckers that are sound like PAFs. Um, the, I, so I don't have a reference. I've never done a comparison. I, everything, anything I say right now would just be marketing things like, oh, the Seymour Duncan 59 or the DiMaggio, you know what I mean? So uh, nothing I really, when I think of the, a good single coil PAF though, I think of the Lace Sensor Blue. I really like that pickup. I think that's supposed to be like a PAF kind of thing, if I recall. And I don't think it sounds like a PAF, but it's got that vibe. You know, it's got a vibe and it said that. So again, this is a very uneducated comment to that question. But I'm curious, you know, I have the, the guitar, the Somnium guitar, the pickup, the neck pickup, uh, the video that was supposed to be next in the series, which was the best Tele neck pickup today. 
<laughs> which by the way was supposed to be a week ago now today the pickups are supposed to show up i mean a, i'm at the mercy of covid uh, i've been buying stuff and and just when stuff shows up it shows up man i just don't know what to do so if that pickup shows up today i'll probably start filming on monday um sparkle tune what's up sparkle tune says what do you think about gmp guitars i i uh, bought one for 600 dollars. that sounds like a really good deal i i don't i may have physically touched one once uh i think at some point cc deville was playing them right gmp guitars that could be wrong um does ryan roxy play one as well like a couple people play them uh us made guitar i bought i bought it in wait i bought in years oh USA made guitar. I bought it in years. Any idea what pickups are in it? I don't. And what's the story is? Um, no, I know very little about them. Uh, uh, I thought they were a California uh, company. Could be. But interesting enough, I am working on some videos. You guys know I've been releasing a lot of these uh, list videos and it's important for me to get all the list videos out. If you guys notice, I've, I've already put out three. I have three more coming. You'll see them very quickly as they're coming out. And the reason is, is because uh, it's a video series that takes a lot of work, but it's a video series that I, I when you do video series uh, that are uh, that are fun and do well, you've noticed all of a sudden a lot of channels start doing them <laughs> too, which is good because it's nice to see everybody's perspective on stuff. But I'm trying to get all these video series out before uh, I see other channels doing them too, which is which I'm fine with. But uh, you know, it gets, it get, yours gets muddy down. So I'm trying to get those out first and then I'll focus on other stuff. But I have some videos talking about some odd guitars uh, and um, maybe GMP is one. I Maybe GMP, I need to add that to that list because that is a brand that did, they did cool finishes on their guitars. That's what I remember. Cool finishes, cool guitars. I just don't know much about them. Um, I'm going to give this a shot. Evil Rockin' Late, Evil Rockin' Nader. Evil Rockin' Nader. I think I'm right on that one. Says Phil, do you think the Boss GT8 would sound as good as individual Boss effects if used in a four cable setup with a Marshall? Um, I personally like uh, Boss's Cosm technology that they use. Uh, I don't remember if the GT8 is. I'm pretty sure the GT8 is Cosm technology. Um, what I mean by that is Boss when they started doing the Cosm stuff, what they were doing, the way that Boss explained it to me was they're copying their own stuff. They're copying their pedals. And the argument being like, kind of like when Fender tries to make a multiprocessor unit and say, hey, who can copy us better than us? It's kind of that same logic. Um, yeah, that would make sense. I would imagine that, yeah, Boss is going to do it better than, than anyone else. Um, and let's be clear, a lot of people aren't going to copy Boss because although Boss is a huge entity, it's one of the biggest pedal makers in the world, if not the biggest, we all love him. We all have him. No one's really trying to emulate the boss sound for the most part, uh, even though we like it. It's weird. But uh, that being said, uh, do I think it will sound as good as pedals? I think it's it's as good. Yes. I like the way you said that. As good. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think you'd want for anything. I wouldn't play the boss GT8 and be like, nah, this doesn't sound like their pedals. I think it does, especially all the modulation stuff. It's really cool. To me, the, the boss GT8 and those pe type of pedals for boss, uh, those processor units, uh, their distortions are darn close to their pedals, but never exact. And it's probably because, it's, you know, maybe there's a little digital going on versus analog. I'm not sure. Some of you guys may chime in and say, no, the Boss GAT8 is an analog unit with digital switching or whatever. But you understand what I mean by that. It's still not the same componentry in it. It's super close, man. It's very good pedal. Plus, that's a great pedal. I used to love my GT8. Um, I did, I had the GT6. I went to the GT8. The GT8 was my favorite. Literally, one of the only times I ever did this, I, I just sold the GT8 and bought a GT10 and then thought I was miserable. GT10 was fine, but it wasn't as good as a GT8 in my opinion. Still say I think that way. And um, and then what happened was I couldn't find a GT8 used <laughs> after I sold mine. And uh, every once in a while I poked around and looked. You know who was using, you know what's funny was, talk about a kick in the in the pants. I, I sold my GT8, got the GT10, wasn't excited about the GT10. Really regretted uh, not having the GT8. Went and saw Nuno Bencourt play in concert with Extreme when they were they were doing the uh, first tour tour back as Extreme. Got some backstage passes. Got to meet Nuno and talk to him and stuff. And on stage, he was using the GT8 through a, 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 his Randall and a Marshall. And uh, his Randall blew that night twice. <laughs> I think he blew two of his Randall amps. And um, anyways, uh, but he was using that. And, uh, and that made it even worse for me because I was like, right, I love that thing. And now Nuno has one and he 
you know, you know how you get like, man, why did I get rid of that thing? So don't get rid of your GTA is what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, all right, let's do some non-penned things to talk about. What else do we got? Well, I, I drink water while I read. Hold on a second. A lot of happy birthday wishes. I appreciate that, guys. Like I said. Uh, Dale says, my birthday is the same day as his wife's. Happy birthday to your wife. Okay, what do we got? Oh, uh, Superjet113, uh, great question. It says, hey, Phil, what is the worst chord you hate to finger on your guitar? I don't like playing the C chord. You know, for me... Uh, uh, it's probably because my hands are big. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big guy. Um, I'm six foot. I mean, it's, you know, not huge, but big guy. Uh, and my paws, these big paws, uh, I, I tell everybody, this is my issue with guitars. When people say, oh, I have small hands. It's so hard on guitar. I'm like, no, man, there, there's, there's two, it sucks both ways. If your fingers are really long, that's actually problematic too. Um, because although Paul Gilbert's ginormous fingers can shred and he can do these spans on his fretboard that are great, but if you're watching when he makes chords, I mean, he's got to literally take his fingers, let's try to put this in camera, bring your fingers over and then like hook them down and bring them down like this versus some people are straight out or straight like this when they touch. So there's always problems. Me, because of my hand size, bar chords were always great. Any kind of, if you notice, I'll do a lot of bark, bark type chord uh, chords. Uh, C chords are great. My issue is always anytime the chords make me bunch up. And as I, obviously as I go up the neck, as the, any you know, the chords, as I get close, uh, as the frets get closer, get a little weirder for me. Cause I just kind of got to have to squinch my fingers in weird positions. And I find a way to do it over the years, but that's the chords I hate the most. Um, and, uh, uh, and of course, you know, like a lot of, uh, players, uh, my age that started playing with power chords. I mean, I started power chords. That's, that's when I went to guitar lessons when I was a teenager, that was like, here's a power chord. And then you're like, oh, I don't need another lesson again. And you're like, oh, we are so dumb. I was so dumb. Anyways, uh, <laughs> but that's where you start. Right. And, uh, my point is, um, you know, you didn't learn any of the cool chords. <laughs> you learned, you learned your cowboy chords, your power chords your pentatonics, right? Uh, you were either going to be a shredder. That's how it was. When I took lessons, it was like, you're going to be a shredder or, or you weren't going to be a shredder. I wasn't going to be a shredder. I wasn't into shredding guitar. At first, I thought I was because it was what everybody told me. My buddies were like, yeah, Yngwie. And I was like, deep down, I was like, I could appreciate that stuff. I love it. Obviously, there's a Steve I guitar behind me. Love Steve I. But let's be clear. If I could be any, think about how horrible this is. If you could, if somebody asked me like, Phil, if you could be any guitar player, it wouldn't be Vi or Halen. Um, it would be some goofy punk rock guy. Cause I just like that. I just like the, the whimsical kind of just playing power chords or playing music and doing that thing, uh, and having fun. So, uh, back to that. Uh, so the, a lot of the weird seventh chords, the ninth chords, uh, that stuff was always weird, uh, for, you know, right for me at first, because I didn't learn that until about five, 10 years after I start playing guitar is when you start like, somebody's like, Hey, these are different chords too. And you're like, Oh, Oh, okay. <laughs> Especially for me, I started on, uh, I started out very, very, very easily on guitar. I started very shortly. I should say on guitar. Um, I, I ended up being a bass player. Like what's the, the best saying ever? Every bass player is a failed guitar player. That's me. Uh, literally I played guitar and I was playing in band doing the guitar thing. And then one day a band needed a bass player. And, uh, you know, and I like the band and if you wanted to be in the band, they need a bass player. So I took and sold my, um, no, actually what I did was a smart, I borrowed a bass and I used, I had a PA, so I had two, one, uh, two 15 inch speakers and a mixing board uh, and a power amp. And I brought it to their band rehearsal space and I plugged a bass into that, I had, uh, a bass into the PA, in my little PA, which they thought was the weird. And then I played bass and we rocked out. At least I thought we rocked out. And then they said, you're hired. And I said, cool. And then I went back to my house. I got my guitar amp and my guitar, my, my PA system. And that crap, uh, well, I had a crappy bass, so I don't think I borrowed it. I think I had a crappy little bass. And I uh, drove down to a music store and traded it all in for a bass and a bass amp. And that's how I become a bass player. And that's how easy that was. All right. So basically what I'm trying to say is, I started playing guitar and then I immediately went to bass and the chords just wasn't a thing forever. Uh, okay. 
Hold on a second. Let me go back to the other screen and refresh it. Maybe. Here we go. Sorry, guys. Let's see where we left off. We left off with Gentry James. Gentry James says happy birthday from Indianapolis. 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 Why can't I say that? Indianapolis. Uh, the ship, right? I mean, obviously the famous ship that sank. Was it named after Indianapolis? Indianapolis says, I'm very interested in a Shiji guitar. This... <laughs> Everybody's just going to get me to do the shes and sounds. Uh, interested in a Shiji guitar. Yep. Uh, it says, after your last vid, any suggestions on where to purchase? Uh, yeah, the Shiji thing is a disaster right now. So let me tell you what's going on with that. Shiji, and uh, I can't say the other company, but Moland is the guy who I deal with, uh, which is the was the distributor. Uh, they're not the distributor anymore. There's some kind of falling out between Shiji and Moland. And again, uh, th this is the important part. Uh, my, my understanding is that's all you got to know is that how everybody was getting Shiji guitars before is not how they're getting them now. Shiji is now going to sell direct or something like that. What I did is, uh, as a courtesy, is I updated the links to Shiji's website. Uh, what I can tell you is I've been talking to, uh, and I always liked Mo. I thought he was a super nice guy, uh, so you know, for the Shiji company. Um, the... Uh, I was very, uh, very skeptical of Shiji guitars, so you know. I think that's very fair. I think it's very, uh, you know, hey, let's be honest, man. It's, uh, you know, a lot of these Chinese-made guitars, you're just like, I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, you're just like, I don't know. So uh, anyways, when they reached out, I was like, yeah, let's send one out. Let's see what happened. But I was really skeptical, and I have to say I've really, really come to like it. And... Um, and, uh, you know, and I have some really amazing guitars, so it says something because it really rates. But really, my big thing with Shiji, and I think I, I've said this in the videos, and that's probably what you're talking about uh, is, that's motivate you, too, is uh, very clearly, so you know, my my buddies that come over, they play that guitar, and they agree. They're like, man, it's really flawless. It's a fantastic instrument. So um, long story short, they're coming up with a telly is my understanding. And I talked to them and they're interested in sending one for me to check out on the channel. So hopefully I'll get to check that out. And they're also trying to fix the distribution or whatever they're gonna do with that. So there is some kind of problem with that right now. Um, so that's what I know. All I can tell you is, is I put a link to their actual website and that's how I would communicate to them. You understand this is a, they're an actual Chinese company, okay? What I mean by that is they're, 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 they're not uh, like PRS has got that new uh, CE20 or CE hollow body two, where that's made in core tech in China. This is a Chinese based company. So of course, um, you know, they plagued with all the issues you're going to have, which is broken English. They, it's nighttime when it's daytime here and all that stuff. And again, I know some of you guys have uh, feelings about that. Keep in mind, you know, um, to me, there's a different, there's a different issue with Chinese people and the Chinese government. Again, I'm not trying to be political. Please don't get upset. I'm not really preaching anything. Everybody do what they want. This is basically what I'm trying to say. Okay. I can't hide the truth. I own 90% American made guitars. Obviously that's how I feel about guitars. I like buying American guitars when I can, right? I'm American. I, it has nothing to do with being American. Whatever your nationality is, I hope you have national pride. I hope you feel good about your country and you you want your country to do well. That being said, I know people get seem to get real sensitive about this issue, but here's the deal. If you don't like Chinese guitars, don't buy them. That'll fix the problem. Don't. It's easy. Um, but back to the Shizi thing. Uh, yeah, you just got to contact them directly or wait. See, I know it's really frustrating right now because a lot of you guys have been asking about that. How do you get a hold of those guitars? So... Uh, Armando. Hey, Armando. What's up? Said so just saying hi. I'll watch tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Uh, enjoy. Enjoy tomorrow. This is tomorrow, Armando. Now, when I'm talking, that looks like it's now. It was actually yesterday. Okay. The Apple Smasher. Your thoughts on used PRS Vela S2 versus Mira S2 and Mira Core and why? Okay. Great. Great. Good questions. Um, well, I'm partial. I like the Mira Core. I have two of them. Uh, can you see one? behind me nope it's out of frame it's over it's right on the other side of the guitar uh so i have two mirror core guitars what i like about the cores are i have the uh, pa a pattern a regular and a pattern thin or wide thin whatever i have both necks on both mirrors uh i like that they're 24 frets on those guitars i like the way they feel uh feel but uh, more importantly i had them before s2s were in, even out so I couldn't say I would pick them over an S2. I'm just saying I picked them before there was S2s, and there's no reason for me to sell these and get S2s. So um, I like the Mira. It's my thing. It's uh, my favorite guitar. 
Absolutely. There's something about the shape. It's like an SG. I just like the way it feels. It feels really close to me. I really like it. It's thin. It plays good. It's got a nice tone to it. So my thoughts is uh, I like the Mira, so I'm partial. I like the cores. If it was me and I was going to buy one right now, uh, nothing wrong with the S2s, but I would find a used core because you can find deals on them. They're lacquer, which is nice, you know, because they got beat up and they look cool. Mine's all beat up because it's mine looks relic for real because it's relic for real. Um, and uh, you can get one for a song. I, I, you can find them for under a thousand bucks for an American made PRS used is really good deal for the mirrors. And to be honest with you, whenever I'm, I, and I mean this, whenever I'm not talking about them, it's usually a good time to, to do it. Every time I seem to bring them up in any length, uh, when I go to look, maybe uh, maybe I need another backup when I go and the prices shoot up to like twelve, fourteen hundred dollars And I think it's just because people start buying them because it's not because of me per se. It's just obviously it's a guitar that's not talked about a lot. So we're giving it some focus. The Vela is a great guitar. I like that guitar as well. Uh, different though. To me, it's a different animal. So it's a different instrument. But that's what I would pick. I'd pick the Mira. I don't own a Vela, but that's another instrument from PRS I'd like because it's a very, I'm very into the non-PRS guitars i like pierce's i think i've said this before i like pierce's quality but i'm not really into the you know like i have a custom 24 but um it's not really my thing i mean i like it a lot but it's not my thing i like the mirror more i like things more stripped down less less exotic looking uh then we got just so you know drb says have you played an fgn uh less paul style guitar i have not only the strats at this point uh, it's hard to find a review on them, by the way. I enjoyed your new $1,000 less video. Thank you, buddy. Uh, those videos are fun. They take way, they're funny. They're fun to make, so it doesn't really matter how long they take, but I think it's fun to learn that they take uh, probably about eight hours to make. Um, obviously, with all the pictures and the, the cuts, it takes two to three hours to edit that. It's no big deal. It only takes about 30, 40 minutes of me talking. So in, a, in the first one, I did three takes. That was, na that was nasty. The second one, I think I did one or two takes tops. Um, and then edited and stuff. Um, but uh, compiling the list takes a few hours. It does. It takes hours to do that list and then sort it through the categories. And a lot of people are asking me to talk about more about the particular categories in that list. And I, I plan to, I just really want to get to a one or two more of these before I start talking about that. Um, just so I can make sure it's refined and I know exactly that's how I want to keep it. Uh, Scott says, I'm looking to go, wait, I'm looking to go all nickel on my Les Paul. Obviously, I keep the original parts. Do you have any Les Pauls that are all nickel? Do you notice uh, a difference in tone? Uh, no, not abs. Uh, well, yes and no. So hold on. Yes, I have a Les Paul with nickel parts, and no, I don't notice a difference in tone. <laughs> uh, yes, you can, but uh, notice is a tricky thing, right? Uh, I can notice if somebody moves the EQ setting on, a, on, on an EQ just a little teeny bit, but notice is a hard thing. Like I noticed them move it and now I hear a difference, but did I hear anything bad to good? No. On the nickel parts, although I, I understand the logic behind them, they, they really chalk, I chalk that up to, uh, yeah, if you're going to put parts on a guitar, maybe putting nickel parts is a cool idea, but I like nickel the way it looks. Let's just start there. I, I'm really not a flashy chrome guy. The nickel hardware looks to me more practical um so there you go there's on that um uh unfreaking believable says uh phil any thoughts on mad hatter wiring harness i really like their stuff uh i was on their website yesterday uh, doing some stuff it's funny that you mentioned it and i was on their website yesterday um i plan to do a couple videos of their uh, uh, uh of their what do you call it? Kits, I guess. If you guys know what Mad Hatter is, they're local. They live where I live in Arizona. Mad Hatter is a company that makes all kinds of components that are truly solderless. So you can in install an entire anything you want. So it's not like a preloaded thing. You can build a kit. So you can say, okay, I want two volume pots, a three-way switch, you know, blade switch, or I want a five-way blade switch, or a four-way, or a six-way blade switch. You can get, uh, you know, four pots or stack uh, push pull pots or whatever you want and all of them come with these basically mini clip units that uh, basically it's wire uh, solderless so you can clip it all in now I want to point this out this is important when I started my channel I was very anti that kind of stuff and what I mean by that is because I'm like hey man I have a soldering iron I mean literally I have a soldering right here <laughs> I don't know why it's on my desk right now but I have a soldering on my desk right now so my point is uh, soldering it's not on so don't freak out anybody <laughs> 
<laughs> um, my point is, I used to be like, well, just use, use a soldering iron. However, he, here's where I'm kind of coming around the bend. Somebody made a really interesting uh, uh, observation and a, a reviewer. And I told you guys this. Hopefully, you guys really believe this. As much as I probably influence you because, you know, an influencer, uh, you guys influence me. And because uh, I listen to what you guys have to say. A lot of times, it's very interesting, the thoughts that you guys put out there. And uh, somebody made a comment about the RC world uh, being the radio controlled cars and radio controlled airplanes. And basically, they're on this clip system. And why don't we go to that? And at first I was like, ah, oh, it's not a big deal. And the more I thought about it, I went, yeah, how easy would that be if we would just go to a, a, a solderless system for most of the guitars? So um, I really like what Matt Hatter's doing. Um, I like what Emerson are doing and uh, 920D is another company that does online stuff where they solder everything together for you. Um, that's really cool, but I really like what Matt Hatter's doing. I think he's on top of things. So uh, to answer your question, what do I think of them? I like the harnesses. I think they're cool. I'm going to buy some. Hold on. I'm drinking water. Or vodka, whatever you guys probably think. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, and I, so literally this is not a, he's not reaching out to me. He's not asking me to review anything. Um, I just thought it'd be cool to, since I'm doing the Somnium guitar thing and I've been talking about that interchanging thing, maybe this would be a thing to add on that, talk about that stuff. Uh, especially as some of the pickups are starting to show up. I actually have some pickups now. It's, uh, like I said, it's been interesting. Keep in mind, DiMarzio has been, DiMarzio pickups have been closed. They were closed for like almost three months. I mean, this is tough, man. This is, this COVID thing has been a really interesting thing for parts companies. Plus, everybody's been at home doing projects. Good for you guys. Sucking up all the parts. It's great, but it's a little difficult when I'm trying to make videos with parts and every company's like, yeah, we're, we're, we're out. Uh, we have Scott. He's here. How do I say Scott? Scott. Just kidding. Hey, Scott. Says, uh, I'm looking to... Oh, he already read Scott. See? Now go back to Matt. Matt says, Matt says, I'm suspicious of guitar companies claim caramelized maple necks instead of roasted you know it's funny i have a good friend that literally just sent me that text a couple weeks ago and uh he was really he seemed really um irritatedly uh, irritated with as well and he says coloring them instead of roasting them thoughts yes uh this is something that i think you're going to see i think this is something that we've seen uh everywhere remember i said once uh, bad ideas are infectious hey look I once saw, I think I, I got to tell you the story. When the gluten craze was at the all-time high, uh, I remember walking by a, a, a stack of Coca-Cola products and it said gluten-free. And I remember just chuckling, right? Like a Coke is gluten-free. And I'm like, okay, you know what I mean? And of course, you know, like why would there be wheat in a Coca-Cola? But that wasn't the point. The point was like, that's how far it's going to go, right? Gluten-free, soda pop. Um, so my point is, yeah, of course, uh, companies are going to get on the marketing trend fast. So I would be very skeptical of the things you're talking about. So yes, we know that uh, uh, roasted maple necks are a process where they're not just putting them in, heating them up in an the oven. There's uh, something where they vacuum out the oxygen. Um, I've had talks about this and how it's done. I've even had some friends that are uh, 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 Tim at Atomic Guitars, which is a really good luthier that is a good friend and a good luthier uh, and a great shop. You guys have seen, I've mentioned Atomic Guitars before. Um, t t Tim had roasted a neck many years ago and showed me a neck. Before it was even a trend, he was doing it. Uh, not. I'm not saying he was doing it first, but he was doing it before the main manufacturers had done a trend and he was discussing the difficulties of doing it. What I can tell you, and I told you guys that, I think I told you guys this, I've, bought, I've owned now a bunch of guitars. I bought a bunch of guitars that have these roasted maple necks and they're not all the same. That is very true. There is something about them that is different that you can tell how different companies are doing it. It's different. So should you be uh, skeptical of using words like caramelized or roasted? Yeah, well, keep in mind, first of all, the most important thing is there's no real probably standardized uh, uh, term for this other than uh, ter tor terrified, right? Terrified, torrified. What do you guys say? It's like torrified. Somebody's saying it. Somebody knows what I'm saying. I can't remember what they call it, but you understand what I'm saying. You just Google it. It'll come up. Say, what's a roasted maple neck called? And it's something like terrified or something. Um, and uh, basically, uh, it's, a, it's a term where they roast the neck and, co of course, remove the oxygen. They're trying to get all the sugars and the moisture out of the neck. The importance of that is uh, this is probably where you would really want to talk to some, like John Sir would be probably an interesting candidate to talk about this. Um, and uh, and um, 
and see what's the difference. What I can tell you is this is where I'm not getting too caught up in it. And here's why I'm not. This is why I'm not. Yeah, Torrified. Thank you. Thank you, E.R. Webster. Um, what I will tell you, <laughs> I'm an old vintage said caramelized should taste good. I agree. What I will tell you is this. The reason why I'm not super caught up in it is the more they actually do the neck the correct way, the more they actually roast it and dark, you know, dark roast, like dark roasted coffee. The more they dark roast it, the more I don't like the neck. Um, my least favorite roasted neck is my really super crazy expensive uh, Ibanez AZ, uh, the one that has the super roasting. I hate that neck. It, 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 it It's a great quality neck. It's really stable, but it's so doesn't feel or it doesn't sound and feel right to me. So I, I ended up liking the lesser expensive Indonesian one more. Um, and that's what I'm basically getting at. The guitars that don't seem to roast them as much, I tend to like them more. So um, Super Jet says that it'll eliminate fret sprout down the road. I think it can. Uh, it, it should, <laughs> but I, I, who knows? All right. <laughs> okay, we get on the weirdest subjects. Roasted, you guys now are talking about roasted barbecues. Uh, Matt Harrison says, do they feel dead? You know, interesting way you say that because that's something I would ex kind of explain it to. Yes, it's almost like there's no sustain in the neck anymore. Does it make sense? The notes are snappy. Remember what I talk about, uh, which is interesting because I've talked about carbon fiber necks, but carbon fiber necks, they always had really infinite sustain. You hit a note and it would hang around forever. However, it just wouldn't feel the same or, you know, I mean, feel like sonically it didn't feel the same. And that's what I get when they really go crazy with these, uh, these roasted necks. Um, uh, uh, Wayne says, who had the best roasted terif uh, torrified maple? I'm probably saying it, torrified, right? Torrified maple neck that you played. Oh, that's a great question. Who had the, the Shiji guy? And that's that's why I said it sucks. They, <laughs> It's a guitar. Dude, Shiji, look, that's a guitar that just, it's like a lot of brands on YouTube. You'd never heard of it. All of a sudden, YouTubers talking about it. It's all a YouTuber hype thing. And what I mean by that is that's, I understand the feeling of that, but I mean, I really like the guitar. It's really, it's really, really good guitar. Um, so you, so you know, um, so that's probably my favorite of the roasted maple necks. Let me look around. I mean, don't get me wrong. I like what Kiesel's doing, but I, I don't even, I don't even think it's actually the companies that I like. I just like the way they did that neck. It feels really good. And then next up would probably be, believe it or not, it, uh, this, um, Ibanez AZ, uh, Indonesian one. The, the premium, not the prestige. But I've heard people tell me that their premium uh, AZ neck is horrible. And I think I told you this. Uh, that particular I Ibanez, that one right here, the one I'm pointing with my thumb, uh, which is my, I call it the candy corn, right? It's like tequila sunrise. That was sent to me by Ibanez, okay? This is probably important to mention, and it is important for me to mention, is I have four Ibanez AZs. I have no idea why. It's the dumbest thing ever. But I have four. I bought three. One I bought used, okay, uh, on reverb. Two I bought uh, new uh, and they, uh, from Ibanez, but I bought them. Okay, so I bought them. And uh, one Ibanez sent me to do a video, and then they left it behind. They said I could keep it. Um, and ironically, the best one is the one Ibanez sent me by far. And so what I will tell you is I don't know if they just like Maybe they went nuts and made sure they got a good review. I, I don't know. Because I've, I've, I've had people tell me theirs are okay. But, my, I mean, this thing is flawless. Like, I play it and I love it. It plays perfect. Everything about it is like I love. So, uh, there you go. And then the next runner-up is the one I bought used. <laughs> okay. Hold on a second. Oh yeah, Music Man. I mean, a lot of companies make good roasted. Somebody's mentioned uh, Nick saying roasted maple necks. Uh, Music Man does good ones. I agree. Okay. Brian says four AZs. Why not five? Phil is slacking. Well, you know why I have four AZs? Because I couldn't fall in love with any of them. Um, I got the first one, which is the red one. I really liked it. I did. But. I kept thinking like, this is the 22 fret with the single coils. And I was like, maybe I need the 24 with the, you know, you should do the thing. And so I got the second one and the second one I didn't like. Uh, that's the sunburst one. 
Uh, it's just something about it. I'm just not bonding with it. It's quality. Like it's one of those guitars, and I, maybe you guys could relate to this. Okay, so here's here's a great subject, and it's a great subject to talk about on a live show. You ever had a guitar that's just perfect and you just don't like it and can't bond with it and then you hand it to two or three different friends and they all tell you how amazing it is? That guitar, every one of my friends is like, it's amazing. And I'm like, I don't like it at all. I don't, I, it's nothing. I mean, literally, I pick it up. I can't find flaw with it. So then because I can't find a fall, flaw or a fault with it, I can't fix it. I can't fix something that's not broken. It plays great. The action is perfect. The frets are immaculate. The, <laughs> the right, everything about it plays fantastic. The tone is fine. Okay. Uh, what I mean by fine is I'm not saying it's bad. It's not great. It's not bad. It's good. It's 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 like um, it's the most vanilla guitar i've ever owned in my life it's just it's it's there's no complaints but there's no passion right i have no i'm just not feeling the guitar and i don't know what it is um now here's the funny part this is the funny part so so what led me down the road that i ended up going down was so i had that guitar that's the most expensive az they make the one I got. And, uh, and it was, it was, it was a good chunk of change, right? So it's an expensive guitar. So I got that one and I'm just not loving it. And then Ivan has reached out and we were talking and they were talking about guitars to send to do videos. And I said, well, I have the prestige. If you send a premium, that'd be a great way to do a video comparing the two. A lot of people are curious, you know, which one they should get. And I'll, I have no problem walking through the two and seeing which ones, you know, giving people just some thoughts on what they would like better. And I think in that video, I say that I end up liking the premium better, the one behind me. I don't know why I can't point to it that one, the, the, the Indonesian one. And so they sent the Indonesian one. And then that really set me down the ro road of hell of, okay, great. Now the inexpensive, now keep in mind when I say inexpensive, it's less than half the other one. So it's still an expensive guitar. They're 1200 street. They're pricey, but half, right? Cause the other ones are like 20. Well, the, the crazy one is 27 street price. So it's, it's pricey guitar street price. So uh, this is that issue that uh, we've talked about in the past where you buy like a $3,000 PRS and then you buy a $700 SE and the SE is better. You know what I mean? Better being you like it more and you're conflicted because you're like, hey, man, I spent all this money. I should be getting a dividend, right? I should be more excited about the guitar that costs more money. And so that's what really set that afire. And so I ended up deciding of the three AZs, the premium was my favorite. And uh, so I go, well, maybe I'll sell the other two AZs. And then I thought, oh, I don't know, I kind of kind of don't like that. So then I found a used one. I got the used one. That one was a really good deal. That was a great opportunity. It was definitely, I bought the AZ. The one I bought, uh, the Seafoam Green, I just bought it because what I paid for it, I could flip it for that in a minute. Uh, in a minute, you guys, anyone would buy it off me for what I paid for it. Uh, and uh, I go, okay, so it's just, I'll try it. And I liked it better than the other two AZs, the first two. Uh, and I still don't like it as much as the premium that I have. So, so that's a, that's that hopefully you guys, maybe that helps you guys. Cause I find sometimes when I talk about stuff like that, a lot of you guys really chime in with either, uh, you know, maybe you feel good cause you realize that I must have it way worse than you and my sickness in my head of guitar <laughs> guitars. And you're like, Oh good. I'm not as ba bad off as that crazy guy. But a lot of you were like, Oh yeah, I've had that problem. And now it's cool to hear somebody say that. Yeah. So that's what happened. So if I could do it all back again, obviously I wouldn't have bought any of the AZs. And if Ibanez would have sent me that, I would have just kept that one and be called a day. So that's, that's it out of the four. I, and, and so, you know, long-term, uh, well, not even long-term, I'm only going to keep maximum of two of the AZs of the four and maybe just the one. I have no intention to keep the, uh, the other two, um, which on a side note, uh, and then it will go next subject, just to share with you. One of the uh, issues, or two of the issues that I'm conflicted with is the two AZs I bought. One I bought and I played at the Rockin' 1000, so I played in front of 26,000 people that night. You know, we played the, the, what, 15 songs or 18 songs in front of 26,000 people. And it was a great night, and I played that guitar the whole night. So it kind of like feels like, oh, I should keep that guitar because I did that event with it. But I'm never going to play the guitar. It's been in its case, and as you guys know, I don't usually do that. It's been in its case ever since. Uh, and the other guitar uh, was great because I got to meet Polyphia and... Um, and do a video with them and they're really cool guys and i really liked uh that experience and that guitar was a, a memento of that so these two guitars have memories with me and that's another problem you guys will understand sometimes your guitars have memories you know what i mean cool cool moments but you get the idea uh 
Uh, Dan Ray says, I have the Seafoam Premium AZ, and it's the best guitar I've ever played. Yeah, played two Sirs in my life. Yeah, I, I remember when I did this. I Think about this. You know I like the Premium because here's what's funny. I did the video where I compare the Premium to the Charvel, which is right here, the Made Mexico Charvel uh, DK24. And I think I said in that video, uh, which was where I still feel, is the DK24, in my opinion, was a better quality guitar. Had better components, better features. I thought the pickups were better, uh, just better. But I like the AZ more. That AZ, uh, I would, I would, I like that guitar a lot. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> I got a hiccup there. Uh, so I like that guitar a lot more. Uh, okay, let's find a new subject. Because <laughs> it feels like it's been the Ivan is... Uh, a moment. Um, let me refresh this while I take a sip. Maybe. And try to, I'm going to try to butcher some more sign ons and names. Okay, what do we got? We have, uh oh, okay, we have the drunken scoundrel. Happy birthday. Hey, thank you, man. Uh, just got an Epiphone Les Paul special. What, uh, what lower price P90s? $100 and less do you like? I care about sound quality. Uh, I really like the uh, the Stu Mac ones uh, that I have currently uh, in, in my. Um, uh, it was well, it's there in the Somnium cartridges right now, and uh, I like them so much that I'm gonna yank. I have a set of Seymour Duncan P90s that I'm gonna yank out a guitar and put those in there. Uh, and I believe those are on the lower price point of those. I really like those. I will tell you this, uh, Drunken Scoundrel. Now again, I like those pickups a lot. Those. Um, the ones they sent me. But what I will tell you about P90s, I said this before and I'll keep saying this. The thing I love about P90s is it's like the only, like if a lot of people, when they start winding their first pickups, they'll do single coils. I think it's a great idea. It's a good first pickup to wind. But P90s are great because to me, a P90 is a hard pickup to mess up. It does what it does. And it's just, it's a beast, man. It's just a, it's got a big ceramic magnet on it. It's wound extra heavy with a lot of winds. Um, so what I'm basically getting at is one of the things I've experienced with P90s and probably more so than any other pickup, okay? And I know some people are like, uh, I know there's some some people who are like, I bought a $6 humbucker on Amazon. It's great. Uh, sure, it's possible, of course. But what I will tell you is this. I, I mean, I've played really cheap P90s, like P90s that when you pull them out of the guitar, you look at them and they look like they were put together with the scraps of other <laughs> things, right? The Just the cheapest junk pickups you can ever, and they were fine. They sounded great. That's what it is about P90s that's great. It's a pickup that's made inexpensively. So it's like, a, to me, for lack of a better of analogy, and maybe probably very American me to say, but a P90 is like a hot dog, right? <laughs> Anyone who's ever had a, a great hot dog like in New York or at a ballpark, it's this horrible, uh, a horrible thing that's floating in disgusting water and stuck on a, uh, on a, it's just a horrible thing. And it's just magic, right? <laughs> when it's right. When you're in the, you know, right? Some of you guys will understand what I'm saying. That's a P90. It's a hot dog, right? So in other words, what I'm saying is don't overthink a P90. I think you can really be okay. I think I feel pretty confident that if you were to pick up 10 P90s, I would imagine it would be one in 10 that just are not that great. And, um, so you can't mess it up. So save a little money and get a good P90 affordable. Uh, I don't know if uh, Guitar Fetish does P90s, but I really like the quality of their stuff for the price. They're another great company for saving some money uh, and getting a good pickup. I really like the DiMaggio P90, so you guys know. That's another one I really like, but uh, you were asking for lower price ones, and that's that's out of that range. Uh, Chuck in Music says, Happy birthday, Phil. Uh, are you planning on reviewing the new Princeton? Uh, it looks awesome. I hope you liked uh, the... <laughs> I like the pleather. Sorry, I'm cheap. LL. Okay, I like the pleather. Yeah, Chuck in Music. Uh, yeah, I plan to review this uh, because I have the same, as you guys know, the same amp, uh, exactly specifications just in the 10-inch speaker. Obviously, they're different colors, but that's not going to affect the sound. <laughs> <laughs> See how I laugh? Because it's the internet. And somebody's like, oh, Phil, I don't think you understand. Turquoise uh, pleather, man, has a different tone than black. Um, so anyways, uh, but anyways, back to what I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Chuck. Uh, I plan to review the the two, A, B, them. Um, what I will probably do, so you know, uh, and this is something I kind of resolved to do, is uh, maybe do a old school not edited, not super mic'd up a, a video, like an old school one. When I was just, you know, back in the day, uh, when you start making YouTube videos, somebody asked me about making YouTube videos last week, or week and we talked about this, but one of the things that I kind of like to touch on too, is when you start making YouTube videos, they're so fun because <laughs> you just turn on a camera and just go. And as your channel grows, 
<clears throat> the tolerance of your imperfections gets slimmer, uh, which is, you know, at first everybody gets to the pass, a free pass, right? You make a video and your shaky camera and your audio is not that great. No one really cares. As you get bigger and grow subscribers, they get a little bit less tolerant of that crap, <laughs> right? Uh, so you got to really work on it and it's really tough. So what I was saying, thinking was maybe, I mean, I'm not talking about doing a really crappy video. I'm just saying maybe more of a chill video uh, and get it out and just put it out. Because like I said, I think you're curious and I need to do it pretty fast because there's not a lot of these, but I'm really curious because this amp is also available in Seafoam, or sorry, Surf Green. And uh, it's the same price and there seems to be a bunch of those out there. So it's really cool. Uh, Reggie. Hey, what's up, Reggie? He's just had happy birthday. Happy birthday, man. Uh, I hope you're doing well. I am surprised you're not working on a project. Uh, Reggie, I think is consistently always working on a project guitar, which is, he's a, he's a motivated guy, which is cool. Um, uh, Shane, uh, says, uh, why do Fender amps have two inputs? Oh, is one for humbuckers? Uh, which one is for what? Great question. Hold on a second. I'm sorry. I got to not only drink water, but literally I need another lozenge. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Uh, to answer your question, uh, the answer is yes to your question. So on your uh, Fender amps, you're going to have two inputs, one and two. The one will just be a normal input uh, uh, jack. Okay. So you'll plug in, you're just going to go right into the amp, no problem. The second one usually has some kind of capacitor wired in it. It usually reduces the input uh, by about five or 10 decibels. Again, different amps have different specifications. I'm sure if you look up on Google right now or Google Fender amps on the manual, it'll probably tell you. This is something that obviously I don't repair an amps for a living, so it's not something I need to commit to memory. What I just need to know is what it does. So that's what's really important. And any, any you guys put comments in there, just don't forget. It's more important what it does than what it is. What does it do? Well, this one is really designed for two reasons, and here are the two reasons. There, it's designed so obviously as you plug in the first one and you turn the amp up, you're going to get the amp to break up because the input is going to overdrive the uh, input stage of the amp and it's going to break up a little bit of distortion, if you will. Now, that's something people like. Most people don't seem to understand, especially the newer players don't really understand that a lot of Fender amps are about distortion, not clean. A lot of people crank those Fender amps and distort them. Uh, so Princeton's and Deluxe Reverbs and stuff, they really are about the, the breakup. Uh, a lot of people, something that a lot of people like to put it in. Um, this amp specifically, if you ever want to hear the real Princeton sound, and this is the 68, so this is not a real Princeton. This is like a basement modded pr Princeton. It's all about taking that bass control to like zero, the treble to about seven, turn that volume up and have a blast, <laughs> right? Uh, so to answer your question, sometimes you don't want it to break up. That's when you would put it in position two. It will uh, dampen the input stage enough to where it doesn't overdrive the amp as well. Definitely if you have a humbucker, you want to do it in position two. So to answer your question, yeah, you could put your single coil in position one, humbucker in position two. That would make sense. A lot of players do that as well. Some players just do position two because they want to keep the amp as clean as possible. And uh, that's what you do for that. A lot of players, uh, especially the older, older uh, players, when I mean by older, I mean old school, let's say old school, they remember using it like a PA system and plugging two guitars into it. Uh, so a lot of players used to do that too as well. Uh, and they get frustrated when new amps don't do that. Excuse me again. But um, but yeah, it's it's uh, that's what you're, it's for. Okay, uh, we have death talking, ticking, death ticking. <laughs> I'm going to say death ticking. Death talk, whatever, to con. <laughs> Sometimes I hope to guys, you guys just are watching just to watch me mess up names. All right, uh, it says, happy birthday. Are you still doing bass guitar repairs for people that are local? Repairs, I just did a bunch this week and last week. I am slowly baby stepping back into the repairs as the COVID thing is happening. Uh, this has been a, uh, you know, obviously you got to take baby steps. So it's baby steps back. Um, and it says, how would we schedule one for an appointment? That, the sad thing is, minus COVID, I had made a deal. So I, I felt like this year, my you know, like, like most people, COVID changed my plans for the year. My plan, which is, I hate telling you guys now, was... I had decided this year to really not travel anywhere. 
So I would probably going to only go to one place, maybe two tops for the entire year, the entire year tops. And the plan was I made a deal with somebody in town to pick up and drop off the repairs there so I could actually increase the amount of repairs I was doing. And and because I, I was I was having trouble keeping up the amount of repairs I was doing in the first place. And then COVID happened. So that was all a disaster. And then that went from, OK, I'm not doing that right now to now I'm not doing any repairs. Like I said, from March, about mid-March to uh, almost mid-July, I didn't do any repairs. I was, I was staying off uh, all repairs. Only a couple emergencies and only a couple close friends. Um, so to answer your question, I, I, hopefully soon I'll make an announcement and, and that'll open back up. But again, I just got to go with what the world I'm in. Uh, says, I'm not old, I'm vintage. Says... Uh, going to take a look at a 96 Lone Star Strat to maybe to buy it. Okay. Uh, any way to visually inspect the truss rod without adjusting to ensure it has already uh, not been maxed? 850 seems like a good price for a made in America fender. Yeah. Um, I think so. 850. I mean, here's here's the rule I like uh, with fenders, and I think it suits it pretty good. You usually pay used what a new fender went for 10 years ago. That's not a great deal. That's just usually. So, uh, you know what I mean? Not not what they paid in 96, but 10 years ago. So if an American Strat 10 years ago was 999, then yeah, that's about what they're going for now. Uh, that's usually a good guideline. And then of course you want to, you know, you want to get a better deal than that if you can. 850 seems very reasonable. Um, me, the cheapest I've seen American Strats lately in the mid sevens to high sevens is the smoking, smoking deals. And usually there's, you know, something to deal with. Uh, and then everything in, in about eight fifty to nine hundred fifty dollars is where I've seen most of them settling. Um, to visually inspect the truss rod, well, first of all, what I can tell you is this: uh, usually, two things go hand in hand. Crappy workmanship usually goes with crappy tools. So when you check out truss rods, pick guard screws, uh, other components on a guitar, what you're looking for is look for the sign of bad tools and that will t- probably tell you you might have a sign of a bad workmanship. So what I mean by that is look at the truss rod, look to see if there's chips in the truss rod um, to see if maybe they use the wrong Allen wrench. Uh, and uh, and the, 96, uh, the 96 Lone Star Strat truss rod I think should be a 3 16th truss rod. Okay. Um, so that's something, you know, just to give you a reference. Uh, but you take your flashlight, you look at flashlight, you look in there. And like I said, look to see if they didn't, not that they stripped it. Obviously they stripped it. That's an issue in itself. But look to see if they haven't jacked with it and done stuff with it. Somebody in there usually gets, it's not, you're not going to break the truss rod. Okay. Um, usually what they're going to do is jack up the, uh, the the end of the truss rod. And that's, so that's where you're going to have issues. It's usually replaceable and it's very, very easy and inexpensive to do. However, like I said, look for the tool, look for it, just visually look for it and be aware that if you see those marks, I'm not saying not to buy it, but it's like, think about everything as like the next step, right? So if you visually look there and you see some damage or you see somebody maybe has been messing with it, may not know what they're doing, that tells you you need to go more into detail into checking out the truss rod. That At that point, I would make sure you have a 316th Allen wrench with you and just test it. You can turn it. It's not going to hurt it. <laughs> so if you know how to t- adjust a truss rod, then just do it. If they don't want to sell you the guitar because you want to do that, I understand that. That's fair because they don't know you from a hole in the ground. But again, you know, I find most people are very reasonable. Um, if I tell them my concerns and what I want, they're, they're, you know, most people want to sell their product to you, even if it's a dude, uh, not a store. He'll want to, you know, he'll want you to do well. And if it, I mean, the worst I probably would ever do is maybe say, okay, I'll let you have it checked out by a, a, an actual tech that somebody I trust. So you could do that as well. 150 bucks is a good investment for anybody. So there's nothing wrong with paying somebody 50 bucks to check out. You know, Think about it this way. If you gave me a choice, 850 bucks, and I don't know if it's any good, and 900 bucks, and I know it's great because it was 50 bucks to have it checked out, pay it. It's worth it. It's insurance. 50 bucks insurance is, is good. Uh... Uh, okay. And he, uh, and he's also now following up saying, thank you, Phil. I just don't know if anyone wants me to mess with it without handling the cash. Of course, of course. 
I understand that too. You you would feel the same if you were in that position too. I wouldn't want some strange guy going, hey, I'm going to stick this in your neck and see if it works. <laughs> Right. This is the tough part. But that's why. But also, like I said, please keep in mind best advice. So let me give you advice that I know is tried and true. And I would I trust it to give it to you first. Never be afraid to walk away from a deal. That's the most important thing. OK, no guitar is is, uh, you know, is that magical? <laughs> OK, no guitar is that is, you know, it's like, is that the deal to, too good to be true? So, um, like I said, you, I find, and I've told you guys this before. I sometimes, you know, on these shows, I, re, I, I, I kind of repeat things I've talked about in the past. This is probably from two years ago. Remember I said this about Craigslist and buying when you're dealing with face-to-face -face with people? Judge the person, if not as much as the actual item. Uh, what I mean by that is get a sense of the person, okay? If the person seems shady, if the person's pinging your radar as somebody who doesn't seem, that seems deceptive or strange, uh, or they're doing something that doesn't feel right, the odds are that everything after that's not going to be much better, <laughs> right? Um, and now, I'm not saying that a person who's deceptive won't not, won't read that way. They might read like a nice person and you're reading them wrong. But what I've experienced in the past is that when I'm, when I'm skeptical of what the person's telling me or showing me, then I already know what's probably going to come next is not much better. So like I said, be prepared to walk away from a deal. Uh, don't be afraid to check things out. Uh, also, everybody should understand reasonable expectations. Your expectation is that for $850, you just want to make sure the guitar is fine. There's no nothing wrong with visually inspecting everything. Um, you know, it gets carried away. I once had a lady, no, no joke, I once had a lady uh, bring a magnifying glass to check out a Paul Reed Smith I sold her for her son. It was his uh, It was his graduation present. No, it's graduation, right? I think it was like $2,500, $2,400 back then. And uh, she came, like literally, like, <laughs> like some kind of super sleuth with this big magnifying glass and she was going through the guitar and uh, and uh, I was like, you know, what can I do? I was like, I understand. You know what I mean? That was a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Uh, as long as, you know, she's not hurting anybody doing it. Uh, so same thing. That's what I would do. Put it at, real ex at realistic expectation. Watch the the, the seller to make sure you get a, sure you get a good sense of that stuff and don't be afraid to walk away. All that stuff will probably work in your favor. Yeah, uh, Nelson says that's the way they do it with guitars and cars. Yeah, of course. And always, like I said, at $300, look, to somebody, every dollar amounts a lot. You can't lose sight of that. I hope I don't ever lose sight of that. So somebody, when I say expensive, I know sometimes it upsets people when I say, it's a $1,000 guitar and expensive. And they're like, $300 in expensive guitars. I understand that. I usually talk in industry standards. So average guitar in the industry sells for $500. Then I think like uh, that's a C average. So guitar more than that is expensive. Less than that is inexpensive. That may not be the right way to think of things, but that's generally when I'm talking. I'm kind of talking in that language. I can't help it. That being said, what I'm saying is, is at uh, sometimes at $300 guitar, it's hard to justify a $50, uh, not set up, but a $50 ticket to some, some tech and say, Hey, check this out and make sure it's right. And they put like a, you know, maybe 20 to $50 price tag on doing that. That's tough, man. On a $300 guitar, that's 10 to 15% of the cost of the guitar. But like I said, at 850 bucks, uh, if you're that nervous, pay somebody to double check it. And it's great. You know what I mean? You know, what's funny is <clears throat> I used to like that in the store. Um, somebody would come in and they'd sell each other a guitar in Craigslist. And uh, it would happen in the shop. It happens in guitar centers too. It's kind of weird to watch it now to this day. Somebody would come in, in in the business. They sell, interact to each other, not in the parking lot, but in the store. They sell each other the guitar. They'll plug into an amp in the store and try the guitar. I always thought that was a little strange. Uh, again, you know. It's just strange. I'm just going to tell you it's strange. But one thing I did like was sometimes they would come in and say, hey, I'm going to sell this guy. Like I had this, I remember the first time it ever happened, some guy came into my store and said, hey, I'm going to sell this guy a guitar on Craigslist. I'm, I'm, and I said, okay, he's coming to your store right now. And I said, okay. And he goes, but uh, I'm going to pay you, you know, I think, uh, you know, 25 bucks, whatever we were charging, 20 bucks to restring the guitar. I'll have you restring it and um, I'll buy a pack of strings from you. And I remember thinking, man, that's fair. That's fair, right? He's a, he's taking out my time. We'll get some money out of the deal. And the customer feels pretty safe about it. Uh, only concern I had was, you know, I obviously I don't want the customer to think they're buying the guitar from us. And, we, you know, if anything goes wrong, hold us uh, responsible. But that was obviously conveyed and it was made made sense. So that's what I'm saying. So that's what I would do is have it checked out. Um 
Jody says, Jody Johnson, great question, says, would you invest in an Asian-made PRS? The word you're using is invest seems is a tough word for me to use with that, <laughs> okay? Uh, invest is a strange word in guitars, okay? Um, and here's, so I just want to be very clear. To me, buying a guitar, any guitar, uh, anywhere, made anywhere, uh, any price point, is is an expenditure, but it's a low risk expenditure. In other words, it's not like some things where you buy something for $300 and now it's worth nothing and you can't even sell it in a yard sale. All guitars have some value. So even if you buy a guitar, let's say in theory, right? You buy a, a guitar that's worth $200 and you pay three and that guitar is no, a no name brand and at best use it's worth a hundred bucks. You pay three, you lose 200, you get a hundred bucks. That's still, you can recoup some of your money. Now, so that's not a horrible, because like I said, buy $300. You can buy, I can name a thousand things you can buy for 300 bucks right now today that are worth literally $0 once you, once you buy them. So uh, what's my point with this? So that's about recouping. So I, that's a word I will use is recoup. If you buy a made in Mexico Strat can used, let's say used. If I buy a made in Mexico Strat used right now, is it an investment? No, but can I recoup my money if I move out of it? Yes. So buying an Asian PRS made PRS is to me is a recoup move. Like, yes, if you buy one, you'll investment means will you get your money back and, and then maybe more? Probably not. Um, but you will get some of your money back so you can recoup it. Um, there's always exceptions, but generally no. So I wouldn't say that. That's why usually people who are uh, investing <laughs> uh, in guitars are buying guitars that uh, perceivably will have more value in the future. And that's something that is usually substantiated by the fact that the w years behind you, those guitars years ago now are worth more than what they were then. So uh, investing is a tough thing. But what I will tell you is this, if you, to be, to be, uh, to, to do this in the guitar business, to make money in the guitar business, you really have to educate yourself a, a lot because the rules change all the time. It's always a low margin um, uh, in, in the investment. You know, the windfalls of buying a guitar for 300 bucks and selling it for $5,000 exist, but it's like Vegas. They're not the norm. That's the exception. Um, even the best resellers in this business are lucky to double their money. Which in some industries, I mean, you know, uh, you know, some industries, you know, especially the antique business stuff, you know, people can buy stuff for three dollars and sell it for five hundred dollars. I mean, that's really not heard of in our industry. Um, Jody says, "Are all PRS guitars made overseas?" No, just SE. So anything that says SE is going to be made overseas. Everything else is made in uh, Maryland. So. Uh, so S2 and core, and of course, private stock are made in Maryland. And then of course, amplifiers are uh, mostly made overseas at this point. They have a few left in the US, but they're mostly made overseas. Uh, Josh just said, happy birthday and sending some love from Australia. Thank you, I appreciate that. Hold on. I am so sorry I have to have this lozenge and drink so much, but <clears throat> I felt it early this morning when I woke up and I took a Claritin. I, I, uh, when I, when this time of year happens, I have to take Claritin sometimes and I don't do it and I always pay the price. Um, John says, and by the way, I think I'm allergic to dogs too, which is an interesting problem to deal with lately. Uh, John says, happy birthday. Uh, a little string wash money for your birthday. <laughs> That's great. See, I love that. That's awesome. Cause one, it's funny. And two, it's a little, you know, hey, yeah, string wash. <laughs> uh, Timmy says, uh, Phil got a 2020 Epiphone SG Modern 2 two weeks ago. Oh, he got an SG Modern two weeks ago. Uh, Fit and Fish is outstanding, plays and sounds killer. Uh, shave the nut, uh, two millimeters for super low string height. Yeah, of course. You know what I mean? Uh, one of the things when I made these lists, a lot of people are like, man, how come Epiphone didn't do better? I don't know. <laughs> You know, it's, it's like, it's like, I, I don't know. Uh, I think I said it in the other video the other day that I think if I hit the price, I, I, I made a mistake when I made these lists. When I made the list, I made them based on what I felt of the price points. But really when I was looking later at like Sweetwater and how they break down and Guitar Center, how they break down price categories, I'm like, maybe their logic makes more sense than mine, but the videos still are fun. And the whole point of those videos of course, is to start a conversation and have some fun. And, and so, but yeah, Epiphone is great guitars for sure. 
Greg K says, happy birthday. Need action adjustment tools more than basic gauge. Do I need both smooth and notch radius gauges? Uh, no, ra uh, notch radius. So what he's talking about is in your radius gauges. Uh, here, I have one right here. I own both. It's dumb. <coughs> Excuse me. Ha ha, and I don't have my notch ones here. That's funny. I was gonna make a point that I only use my notch ones and they're not here. So I, all right. So I know I just, yeah, <laughs> this is going to sound dumb what I'm going to say, but all right. So the, so here's the deal. They make notched and unnotched radius gauges. I have both, but I use the notched. To me, the, the unnotched are really for people who are going to do planning fretboards and building guitars are definitely more common. Think about this way. One of the things that I think about that's fun is, and I've said this before, there's there's two, think about like a de car designer and a car mechanic. There's a guitar tech and a luthier, someone who builds guitars and someone who fixes guitars. <clears throat> I've made my living fixing guitars more so than building guitars. I'm about to lose my voice. <coughs> I don't know if we're going to be making much more than 10 more minutes. Okay, so what's my point? My point is, is some tools are more focused for repair than they are for um, uh you know, building and stuff. So the notch ones are better for uh, building or repair. I'm sorry, guys. Um, so what I'm saying is there's these ones. These are the under saddle ones right here. There you go, under saddle ones. And these are great. If I'm gonna use a non-notched one, I use the under saddle ones. These are great, I recommend these. And you can get away with these even if there's strings on the guitar. So something like this is nice, but these are more so for the bridge and less for the fretboard, but you can get away with this if you want, but I like the notched ones. So I would do the recommend the notched ones. You know, I re I had originally talked to Stu Mac about doing, uh, well, they talked to me about, they had me send them a list of tools that I think are mandatory for maybe a basic setup. And they wanted to put it together as a kit and offer it to you guys. Uh, and so I'm gonna, and I never got any follow up, but it's in COVID. So I never got any follow up with that. Excuse me. I'm sorry about this lozenge thing, but I got to do it. Um, so what's my point is, uh, I'll try and follow up with them. If nothing happens from that, I'll just put it together myself. It's just a list. Um, they wanted to do a thing where I got a kickback every time you guys bought the kit. I really don't care about that. <laughs> you know what I mean? I really just want you guys to have the information. So I'd have no problem making a list. I just thought it'd be cool because I could send people to the list versus, you know what I mean? So I'll create up a list. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. All right. Now, what do we got? We have, uh, Frederick says, should I buy a standard deluxe reverb or save for a hand wired one? Um, that's up to you and your decisions. Uh, but I don't, I don't own any hand wired, um, Fender amps. I did a uh, hand wired kit. I did the Stu Mac and Mojotone 5E3s. I wired that myself. That was fun. But uh, bu buying hand wired, uh, it's not it's not something that's like appealed to me. I've played a few of them and they were great, but I didn't feel anything. I have the deluxe uh, reverb, uh, 65 reverb, and I love it. It's perfect. Uh, and I bought mine used <laughs> for a deal. So I, I was totally happy with that. So do that. I would recommend that. Uh, Tony said, uh, happy birthday, man. Thank you. Says, uh, here's $10 for a new hat fund. Ah, a new hat. I have lots of hats. You don't like my hat. <laughs> you know why I wear this hat. I've said this before. Now I don't really need to think I wear it anymore. I changed the lighting room. I talked about this before. Hold on. I talked about this in the lighting of the room. The issue with the hat was, uh, when I had the lighting in the old way, the light was glaring off the head and it was distracting. Well, it was distracting to me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I need a hat. This hat just hangs in this room. <laughs> There's no thought. Plus, plus, let's be very clear. Most of my hats, uh, it, so here, here, here's the thing with the Know Your Gear shirts, right? I wear the Know Your Gear shirt. You have to understand, most of my shirts, 90% of my shirts and my hats are gear, okay? You can't have this much of a problem like I do, a much a, a, an addiction to this and not buy your clothes the same way. So. I have Fender and Gibson shirts and PRS and Ibanez and, uh, you know, you name it, Stumac shirts, You every shirt, right? Music stores, I probably got eight 
eight or nine music short store t-shirts and then hats i have uh my favorite hat is this uh golf hat that's a prs hat and i wear that a lot the problem i have when i do the live show is i don't want to wear those hats because uh when i do uh it gives people the impression that maybe they're funding or are sponsoring the live show and um the reason I don't do that is because I, I want to make sure that everybody understands that the live shows that you watch every week are sponsored by Patreon. The patrons sponsor this. They're who who pay for this to be. And when I say sponsored, is this goes on as a podcast. More people scream it as a podcast than watch it on YouTube. And there's no revenue from the podcast because I, I don't have a – you don't get paid like YouTube. You know, I get the – whatever the quarter of a penny every thousand views or whatever the heck it is that they pay us a couple bucks every thousand views for these videos. And then, of course, you guys doing Super Chat stuff. But, I mean, just saying, you know, the live shows get funded by uh, the patrons, you know, right, for doing this. Because um, they don't get huge views, right? These are too long of videos. No one, you know, I can't get 100,000 people to watch a, a two-hour two video of talking. It's crazy. Um, that being said, uh, the patrons uh, support it that way. So, uh, that's why I don't want to wear anything that promotes a, any kind of brand particularly. Although, of course, I say that why. I have this fender here, but I like I just told you, I bought this fender. So obviously, um, fender gets a free promotion because I bought a bought him an amp. I bought I bought an amp. Uh, let's see. Okay, so to oh, I did Tony already. He says Brian. Hey Brian, Brian, what's up, Brian from Live Wires? Check out their shows on Mondays now, not Tuesdays. No, not Wednesdays. They were on Wednesdays. Now they're on Mondays. So he says, happy birthday. What is your bass string height starting oh, point for a setup on a new bass with high action, Fender Mustang, short scale and case? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> um, I know mine are going to be stupid low. My bass strings are stupid low on the bass. Um, I, I generally, have, uh, generally have about one bass that is set up like a normal bass guitar. The other ones are set up with action so ridiculous that uh, uh, literally most people, when they try to play them, they can't play them. This is from years of developing a technique of playing really light and um, using a lot of the amp's power to get the, the low end frequency out of. I'm really not plucking the, uh, and I really mess people up because even when I did, when I did that video with Larry Mitchell and you saw me, and a lot of people saw me like hit the bass like this, they were like, oh, but you understand, like if I was, if I was, you wouldn't even barely feel my fingers if I was doing that to your arm because I'm not really hitting very hard. It's just more of a, a, a show, showmanship. You know, hey, look at me, I'm doing this thing, but I'm really not touching the, the strings at all. Um, so I keep it really light and really low, um, uh, which is not something I recommend, but it's something I got used to. So on that, to answer your question, I don't know, but I could probably text you uh, the answer and then I'll tell everybody what it is next week because uh, I have to, I don't have a base. I would grab one, but I don't have bass. I had to make a decision when I redid the hangers in here, and I set them all for guitar before the hangers were about being universal. So there's literally no... Well, I could hang basses in front of me, but I didn't think to do that today. So I don't have a bass. Otherwise, I have my... I have my... I have my measure here. I just have no way to... No bass to measure. And I'd go grab one real quick, but they're literally all put away. I don't know why. They're all, I'm, they're all down. They're all down right now. Uh, Jeff says, happy birthday. Know your beers and gear next week. Yes, next week we're going to do the happy hour, right? I think that's what we just called it. Uh, it's the same time. You don't have to, we decided to uh, do everything at the same time. Into the last video of the week, because this is my, our month, I'm going to do, I'm going to drink beer, <laughs> apparently. Uh, I say that because I'm like, lozenges and beer, I guess. Uh, no, I'm going to drink, a, I have a beer, and um, we're going to try to do a little bit more different vibe uh, live show. See how that goes for fun. So don't miss next week. <laughs> uh, I'm just laughing going. Sometimes I'm like, I don't know if this is going to be a good idea. It's probably not going to be a good idea. Uh, so um, what else do we got? We got Wayne. Wayne says, hey, who had the best roasted terrified? Wait, isn't this what we already did? No, this is a question. Oh, I already answered it. I just answered order. order. Okay, so now we have... <clears throat> I'm going to say Natel Park Dude. <laughs> says, hey, Phil, I bought a brand new PRS SE Custom 22 that needed a nut job and, and or trim adjustment because it wouldn't stay in tune. 
Uh, is it safe to assume a core model would not have such an issue? No, no. I mean, yes and no. Here's what I'm going to say no. Uh, technically, the same argument that people can make about uh, the Floyd Rose Bridge and the idea that the uh, heavy st the steel ones are much better than some of the cheaper cast uh, units. Uh, yes, technically the core bridge is a superior quality machined component bridge. Uh, you know, I don't say component, but machine bridge to the import version. Um, here's the thing about this, and it drives me crazy. Okay. You say in the comment, I'm just so I'm reading your question. It says, uh, you bought a brand new PRSSE Custom 22 that needed a nut job and or trim adjustment. Well, the nut job is not really uncommon. It's a Graftech style nut and uh, it might need some work, but I mean, it's really simple to do that on that type of nut. It's not a really problematic, but the trim adjustment uh, also, um, I did a video, five things you don't know about PRS and it talks about this. And it's important to re remind people that the PRS bridge has six screws and the six screws have a uh, be below the top has a notch cut into the screw and all six have to be at the right height for the blade of the six holes of the bridge to line up on. This is the best way to explain this is like using my hand like this. The, the, the bridge is got to rest into us just like you would see on a Floyd Rose where they have the post and it has a notch cut in it for the blade to re rest into that post. Um, there's just six of them. I do it so much, it drives me crazy, okay? People tell me all the time, Phil, I have this PRS. It doesn't matter if it's American or import. I'm literally losing my voice, guys. I'm sorry. <clears throat> so it says, um, it doesn't matter if it's American or import. What it is, is it says, oh, it won't stay in tune. The bridge won't stay in tune. You have to make sure those screws are set correctly. Uh, I don't remember seeing any literature in the PRS uh, gig bags and stuff about it. Maybe it's something that's not talked about very often, but it is important. So that's a big factor. Tony says, happy birthday. Thank you. <coughs> As I lose, I'm dude, I swear I'm going to lose my voice today. Oh my goodness. Uh, and I'm out of water, I think. No, I'm not. I'm good. I have water over here. Look at that. We can keep going. Make it for a few more minutes. Uh, it says, uh, Gary says, B Gary Big G says, uh, hey man, how's the guitar build off going? Wait, I think we already did this, right? Oh no, no, it's a different question, but we already answered that, Gary. Uh, how the build off was going? I'm going to start in August and uh, have it ready for September. And I really don't have anything special planned for it other than to put it together and um, I don't know, make a cool kit guitar build. Uh, little 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 X pig. Oh, you know, I thought I asked you, how do I say it? And you, I don't think you responded to me. Uh, oh, it's pronounced Little Pig. He he's did it now. Okay. Uh, so Little Pig is a, a patron. And I asked him on Patreon, how do you say Little little X Pig? So it's Little Pig. I got you, Little Pig. Uh, it's my gamer name for 20 years. Ha ha ha. The X is a line break. Gotcha. Also, you think uh, I should put GNL M MFDs in my American Pro Tele? I like the sound of the GNL better. Yeah, of course. If you like the way it sounds, put them in there. GNL makes fantastic pickups. That's one of the things that they got uh, nailed. Alex says Squire was. Oh, okay. I like where this question is. Uh, so Alex is saying Squire was a shameful brand growing up, but I just bought a classic Vibe Seventies bass because of your reviews. Okay, what has made them so much better? Then before materials build process things. Sure, of course. I I attribute this to one man. His name is Chris. Um, I don't want to say his last name because I don't I don't you know. I don't. But uh, what happened in I'm gonna say I think it was in 2004 maybe 2003. Chris took over uh, Squire at that time, and uh, that's when you noticed it. It was a big improvement. So Squires had some good years and some bad years. Of course, there's some Japanese Squires that people really covet. And they're really cool. But as a whole, what happened with Squire was, in my opinion, <laughs> as I always clarify, uh, that um, when Chris got a hold of it, I think his logic was Epiphone is killing it. You know what I mean? We all know Epiphone was the same thing. Epiphone was a shameful brand too. It's a, you know, I like the way you put that because it's true. You know, um, Brand names used to be so funny. We used to be so addicted to them. I, not that much has changed now, but definitely we're more open. Let me let me tell you, no one would proudly play a Harley Benton 20 years ago. Everybody, you know, right? You got Shane for, because it was a money thing. They knew you were broke. 
You're like, oh, what do you got? A squire? What are you, broke? <laughs> right? Um, and it wasn't had nothing to do with the quality. The quality was pretty good even back then, but it was definitely that vibe. What ha- But what happens is, is Squire was able to brand itself in a new way using Chris. And yes, they improved. Not only the materials have improved for sure, but one of the things that really improved with Squire is the specifications. In other words, for the longest time, one of the biggest nightmares of Squire was nothing was specced like a fender. So you would get a pick guard, but you couldn't put an aftermarket one on it. And you couldn't put a bridge on it from a fender. And you couldn't put tuning keys. Nothing would work, right? It was just frustrating all the time. You had a thing that looked like a fender, but it didn't interchange with fender parts. And that has mostly changed. A lot of that has changed, especially anything that's mid price Squire now, uh, you know, besides the really entry level $99 bullet stuff. And even that's come far away and specced out way more like a fender than ever before. But but yes, they improved the value. The bass brand, especially even more so than the guitar brand, in my again, in my opinion. But uh, yes, but the other thing is that's really happened is they, they are able to market Squire in a new way that makes a lot of sense. And here's what I mean by that. I think, uh, I think, um, and I don't have a great analogy for this. I should, I should, but I don't, which is, you know, if you think about a classy car, maybe let's say Fender and Gibson are the classy car. And sure, if everybody has a classy car, you know, they have some money, they make some, ch- some cheddar, so to speak, if cheddar Kung Pao is watching. Um, uh, but you know, now people buy cars that are like Toyotas and you know that they're just buying good value. They're like, Hey, I buy a car, a Toyota, cause I know it's going to last a long time. I think Squire has proven itself to be that. Uh, which what I mean by that is you you see people, you see players purchasing a Squire or an Epiphone based on a very practical decision, not a I'm broke is a joke and I can't afford the real deal. That that has gone away because of the fact that let's be let's be honest, right? I, I've said this many times, I said it with the PRSs as well. It's not a, uh, a decision of uh, should I buy a, a, a American Fender guitar for a thousand bucks? You know, you can pick one up used. I can buy a Squire Tele and a Strat and a bass and have three good instruments, really good instruments. I'm going to say great, maybe great, very good instruments. And maybe that's better. You know what I mean? It covers more basses, right? I have the Tele sound, the Strat sound, and a bass. Maybe even the Jazz Master, right? So there's very practical things to that. Um, I will tell you this, and I've said this before. I've spent a long time collecting guitars, obviously owning a store for 12 years, repairing guitars for the last 16 years. Uh, the collection grows, and now being a YouTuber, I've been just—I've been in the industry. I've been connected to so many, so many people in the industry doing stuff that there's just this has been a growing collection for many years. It's a lot of a lot of hard work, more so than money. I've never been, never been so. Kishy. What is it, cashy? I don't know what the kids say. What do you say when you say you got a lot of money? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what to say. I don't have that. I just have, I've been in the industry. Like I have friends that work at Guitar Center and they have collections that will blow your mind because they're smart. They knew when the good trades came in, they bought them. So that being said, uh, this, is, this is the result of a lot of hours of hard work getting that done. That being said, if I could go back now, if they had the guitars they have now, I wouldn't buy this stuff. You know what I mean? Uh, and slowly I move the other way direction too. I've actually bought more of the uh, more inexpensive guitars because they're so good. So there's things to be said about both directions, right? Um, but to answer your question, yeah, it's really good stuff. That's what changed. I'd say about 2004 and it just got better after that. And I think he's really, and, and also better colors, better things. I mean, like I said, Squire's a legitimate brand now. I think that's to be said. Okay, uh, prize hole, <laughs> prize hole reprisal says, "Hey Phil, love the show. I sold three guitars during quarantine, and today my dream guitar came in. All right, what is it? It's a 2007 ESP. Oh, uh, Alexi Alexi Lejo, uh, uh, and I'm probably saying it close, right? I know who he is, Alexi Lejo from uh, Children of Bodom. Uh, and uh, ever try one? I vaguely remember." holding or at least tr- you know trying briefly the Alexi 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 Leho uh, guitar uh, I don't remember anything specific about it uh, if I recall it's like a V right it's a it's a like a Randy Rhodes style-esque type uh, one of those V's I hope I'm right if not <laughs> but that's what I remember it to be um, he's a sick player I remember the first time I saw him he was one of those dudes that when that when you see him play it's just really crazy fast really good guitar player so i really like it so yeah that's cool i'm glad uh i have like th- two or three children of Bodom albums they're pretty good stuff um 
Congratulations, by the way. That's always cool uh, to get a new guitar, especially, like I said, thin the herd a little bit, so to speak. Get something you really love. It's always a good idea. Uh, Robert says, do you have any recommendations on an aftermarket uh, uh, Piazzo uh, upgrade? Uh, and it says, and should I install it on a fixed bridge or tremolo system? Um, yeah, I've, I've experimented with a bunch. What I can tell you about the uh, the Piazzo system is it's not about the system. I think the system gets too much credit and sometimes not enough credit. And here's what I mean by that. It's the guitar. They really need to be in the right type of guitar. Um, uh, if me, some of the best uh, systems I've seen aftermarket put in are like in tellies. Sometimes in the strats is just too much, uh, too much treble. You know what I mean? They don't, the problem is also to understand they, they really don't react well to the smaller gauge strings. They get thinner. The acoustic sound gets thinner. Um, it's a trouble. You know what I mean? If you notice a lot of companies when they, when they make guitars with the Piazzo system, they'll put 11s on it. Uh, I've, I've experienced that too as well. You could do nines and stuff. I'm not saying you can't do that, but I mean, it really does affect the sound. It gets really bright and really shrill. Um, the other thing about them too is uh, the, a good Piazzo system. You gotta understand, there's a lot of people say this all the time. They're, they're tinny and they're harsh and they're not very good. Yes, that's absolutely true. It's no one wants that system. Uh, we use it because uh, it's what we have available to us. Uh, so that being said, uh, the Ghost system is really good. Uh, by uh, GraphTech. Uh, LR Bags makes a great system, and the Fresh Fishman guys make a great system. I tend to use uh, the Go system by uh, Fish, uh, uh, GraphTech just because it's easy to install and I trust it. But that being said, uh, it's the type of guitar you want to put it in, but more importantly, make sure you spend some money on a good preamp pedal or amplifier for it because you're going to find it's never going to sound good until you, you fix that problem. Uh, that's going to be the most of the sound right there. Just like a good acoustic, electric acoustic guitar, you're going to really need something for it to go into that's going to really, really make it sound good because it's not going to sound too awesome coming out the, out the gate, so to speak. Uh, Eddie says, hey, Phil, what do you think of the Harmony guitars? The ones coming out of Kalamazoo. I haven't tried them. I only saw the little teaser on, uh, um, and I probably saw it from Ryan at 60 Cycle Hum. I think he did a quick little video about them at Summer Nam. And um, I'm sorry about my clicking, if you can hear my, my lozenge. Um, if I recall, I like walked by the booth, I saw Ryan, and then later I made, made a point to look for the video. I'm pretty sure I'm doing, again, that was pre-COVID days. <laughs> Remember before COVID? Um, so again, no, no real experience with them at, at all. Um, and that's why, like I said, uh, you know, that's where it gets tricky. You know, I try to put my hands on as much stuff as possible. And, uh, and luckily, uh, YouTube has afforded me more of that opportunity than ever before. But even then, it's just impossible to get to them all. Um, okay. Uh, snake juice. Snake juice. But it's, I think it's snake. Snake juice. It's like snake juice. But snake juice says, what's your opinion on musicians who partake in cannabis before practice into enhanced creativity in legal places of course right we're not advocating breaking the law where i live in arizona it's medical use only sincerely a canadian uh yeah uh here's what here's what happened um i don't know if this is true by any means but it seems to be what i've concluded in my life uh P musicians who who smoke uh, or take take whatever you, whatever however they partake now they eat a gummy bear or s vape it or whatever uh, anyone who smokes weed and plays guitar or drinks alcohol and plays guitar I think it's conditioned to uh, you doing it uh, in other words what I'm trying to say is like I drink alcohol now I didn't for so long that if I try to drink and play guitar now it's like almost impossible. But yet I have friends that drink and then play guitar. It's like, no, no problem. But I've also have friends who literally drink a lot, but will not drink until they, after they play their show because they can't play and drink. Uh, so the same thing uh, goes for that. Um, um, uh, you know, there you go. Um, I will tell you this. Uh, this is uh, this is how we'll end it for the birthday. I got one more and no more Super Chats. Uh, appreciate all the birthday wishes. Appreciate everything. But uh, I'm going to do one more after Snake Juice. I'll tell you this funny story because it happened to me uh, last year-ish uh, ago. Um, I had my first ever edible. Uh, you guys will know what that is. Uh, you know, hey, I'm an adult. And um, I was in a state where it's legal. And I had a first edible cookie. Uh, if you guys don't know what that is. 
that is, uh, you know, they put pot in a cookie, I guess, right? So here's the deal with that. Uh, I learned something. There's no, um, I, I thought it was weird what happened. And here's why. I'm trying to give you, a, I'm trying to get a prop to go. Here's a prop. They had the cookie and I read all over the cookie and there was no suggestion for uh, dosage. Like it didn't say like eat a quarter cookie or eat a half a cookie or eat the cookie. Um, and uh, here's what ended up happening. So I already had been drinking. It was at a, I was at a, at a friend's house, our apartment. No, don't listen to me. I was at a friend's hotel room and we were going to see across the street to go see a stand-up comedian. And so we were at this hotel, a nice hotel, and I had a couple of uh, alcoholic beverages, uh, some beers, and then it was time to eat this cookie. This is the very exciting moment in the life to eat this edible and then go watch a stand-up comedian. And so um, I never had tried it before. <laughs> this is where, I, where and I learned, I learned a horrible lesson that night. So what happened was they said, oh, you just eat a piece. Well, I ate a piece. Now, this is the problem. I had no one, you know, like a, a shaman or whatever. He had no one to take me on the journey, okay? So I ate the piece of cookie. And uh, the the show was on in like an hour. And I, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes go away. I felt nothing. I was like, this is not, it's not working. That's not working. So I should eat some more. So I ate another piece. This piece is a little bigger, maybe like that big or whatever. And, uh, and then we go and uh, we go to the, the club and they seat us. And we're watching stand-up comedians, are hilarious. And I don't know what happened next, but it felt like my whole body decided to go to sleep. <laughs> like it just went to sleep without me. <laughs> without, didn't care to tell me this was going to happen. Like my arms became like 600 pounds and my legs. And um, I couldn't hold up my head anymore. And so I got up and apparently what I remember later, my friends have corrected me. What I remember was going to the restroom, excusing myself during the comedian, by the way, going to the restroom for about a minute and coming back. And then I went another time for a minute and came back. The next day, the story is a little different. Talking to my friends, apparently I disappeared for 30, 40 minutes at a time. <laughs> what I remember was sitting in the bathroom stall at the comedy place with my head on my hands like this, holding up my 800 pound head. Uh, and then uh, I went, we went back to the hotel room and I passed out on the couch. Uh, so, uh, so long story short, no, I can't do that and play guitar. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying never again, uh, but uh, you know, that's where I ended with that. All right. So there's my, there's my thing, by the way. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to say is, uh, yeah, they should put dosages on those things. Um, uh, <laughs> Brandon says, there's no sh shaman for weed. You got to try other stuff. I'm like, ah, oh, great. Right. But you get the idea of what I'm saying. Uh, and Matt says, oh man, edibles are a danger. Well, you know, here's the thing, man. You, you know, um, uh, it's uh, a lot of my buddies, a lot of my friends all have the stories. Look, when they were young and they were uh, in their teens or their 20s, they have the drinking stories, they have the drug stories. Um, I had my first, I think I told you guys this, I really didn't drink really my first real beer until I was 38. I, I maybe had a little bit before that, but never really in any kind of way. So it was um, not something I, I partake, per, you know, partu per, you know what I mean? I partaken in, I'm making up that, that word right now on the spot. Anyways, uh, so there you go. Um, <laughs> so there's my story. Be cautionary tale for those of you. Stay away from the cook. And you know what's really scary about that is, again, I have no um, no positive or negative opinions about that stuff ever other than, you know, it's kind of like when my friends gave me that logical pill that said, hey, man, how could you have an opinion about something you've never even tried? I'm like, well, you know, at this point, maybe he's right. But what I was going to tell you was, is uh, about that is what's really scary about that. And I've been thinking about that ever since is somebody could just hand you that cookie and you could just eat that. You wouldn't know what I didn't taste like anything. I, I couldn't imagine what happened if I ate the whole cookie. Obviously it wouldn't get you know hurt. It doesn't kill you or anything, but geez, I could imagine. Um, um, somebody says, you mean you didn't get, you didn't throw up and get drowned when you're uh, grounded when you're 17. No, nope. None of that stuff. Um, Uh, Tony says, I've never tried drugs or alcohol and I'm of age and I don't care for it. Yeah. You know, it is, it's, it's not, it's not a really appealing thing to me. Um, to be honest with you now at this point, I've tried to get into whiskey. I think I've talked about that. I've tried to get into whiskey a little bit. It's okay. Um, 
you know, try, uh, trying what he means, tr- tasting and stuff. And now a little bit of the craft beers and stuff. <clears throat> it's really just, you know, at this point, I, it's about trying things. Um, but it's not really my heyday. Like I said, I'm more, my, my vice is coffee. <laughs> That's where I'm going to be forever. Um, all right. On that note, <laughs> that note, hold on. There might be one more super chat. I know I said no more, but I'll do one more. It's the birthday weekend for whatever. Okay, we have one more. Waterford Giant. I just don't want to forget his. He says, uh, okay, recommendation for a base amp at $500 and up to $1,000 if worth it. Uh, new adult player, excellent drummer. New or used? Uh, yeah, uh, well, obviously used, man. We talk about this all the time. Used is always, especially with amplifiers, especially bass, solid state amplifiers, stuff like that. There's not a whole lot of things that go wrong with those uh, amps. So uh, something I'd recommend, uh, you, you know, the problem is that you're going to notice, this is what you're going to really notice. The bass amp industry has really pretty much dis- disappeared. You're not going to find a whole lot of bass amps in the market. Uh, you're going to go to a lot of stores and find there's pretty much the Fender stuff. There's going to be a little bit of the PV stuff, a little bit. Uh, there's going to be the TC electronic stuff, if that's still hanging around. Um, the, like the brands like SWR and all that stuff is just gone. There's Ampeg, of course. And this is where it gets a little tricky because you're asking a question, but it's like, what style of music are you trying to play? You know, what do you use? Um, and uh, so that's where I, I would say, hmm. I mean, here's what's sad. I don't even, I, I don't even, it's funny how the bass market's changed so much. I don't even care anymore, but bass amps. What I mean by that is, I've said this many times. I use a bass preamp. Um, the one I'm using is the Eden one. Uh, it's got a compressor in it and I take that everywhere. <clears throat> I'd say eight, I'm going to say eight out of 10, just be safe. It's probably nine out of 10, eight times out of 10. I just plug direct into a PA, use the monitors. That's my bass amp. The other 10, two times out of 10, I use whatever bass amp they have, or I bring an inexpensive bass amp and I just plug into that uh, because that's where I'm going to get my sound. And I DI into the, into the board and then I run the bass amp as a monitor. I really like Fender rumble stuff. It's very inexpensive. It's very good. Uh, it's not amazing. It won't blow you away, but it sounds really good. Um, Another bass amps, obviously Ampeg stuff's always been interesting, but it, it's, again, it's a sound you're going for. I love the Ampeg sound. So something to think about that as well. Um, what else? That's it. It's it's tough. When somebody, when some of you guys have asked about doing bass reviews, like amp reviews, and there's just not a lot, right? Oh, Aguilar. I mean, Aguilar is good. So is, um, so is um, Galen Kruger. Uh, again, there's a couple bass amps. Oh, you know what else? I'll tell you. Here's one I really like. I like the Harky stuff. Um, I really like that. The high drive stuff. Check out that amp and cabinet or or the combo. Really cool. Um, <laughs> I'm just looking at some of your comments. All right. So on that note, I'll let you guys go. And uh, oh, okay. And it last, I know I always say last one, but this one is because it ties into something really cool. Uh, so uh, Distrado, Distrado, Distrado the Blues, <laughs> Distrado the Blues says, Phil, still like the Positive Grid Spark. I finally received mine today since February. Yes, I absolutely love it. Uh, I probably used it more than anything else. I've been trying to keep very quiet about it. It's riddled with everybody being very frustrated they're not getting theirs. And um, the the only critique on uh, on me that I agree with is when people are like, hey, man, how can you promote something if they're not shipping it? Yeah, I did the video because, like I stated, um, I thought a lot of people who were looking at getting it or or – or, or would order it might appreciate a review about it. Uh, obviously, I, I pride myself on being very upfront and honest. Whatever I say in my videos is what I said. No company's ever, uh, A, told me what to say, or B, ever seen any video pr- and had any kind of say in what you guys saw. Uh, comes uh, And as you guys can tell in a lot of my videos, like my rating videos and stuff, you know, I, I obviously want to have good relationships with companies, but I, I'm never afraid that at any point, you know, that they don't want to work with me anymore because... It's not, it's not where I get my revenue from, so it's not my focus. That being said, I really like that amp. Um, so much so that I'm really trying. I, I, I almost did it yesterday. I'm trying to find the Yamaha THR10. I'm trying to f- find one in stock. I think I found one in stock. Sweetwater's out. Everybody's out. I really want to buy one. It's $299. And the reason is I don't want to talk about the Spark until I do a video. I want to do a video of those two, comparing those two, because I know the Spark. Look, here's my opinion on Spark. It's a great amp. 
If you get it, you're going to totally be happy with it. I don't know anybody who hasn't got it that hasn't been happy with it. Maybe a couple of people I saw coming here and there, but dude, on, seriously, it's a fantastic amp. And I know I'm kind of really selling it right now, and I have some of you guys are going to buy it. But please be aware, because I have a lot of friends that order one too, and, and it's this. They are horribly behind in trying to send those amps out. And some people are really upset about it, and there's ever every right to be. Um, so that's what I'm basically telling you is I don't want to promote something that can't, you can't, you know, you can't get, and you're going to, like he said, uh, Distrato is waiting since February on these amps. Now I'm getting, now here's the good news. There's good news. This is why I want to do the video soon, very soon. And I'm, like I said, it will be something I, I have in a high priority to a comparison of that in the Yamaha THR 10. The reason is, is because I've heard not from Spark, but from, from, from the community at large that I guess it's going to be sold at Sweetwater. So the Spark, it will be available at Sweetwater. And of course, at that point, you won't have to worry about, um, you know, waiting six months and stuff. You'll be able to click it and buy it straight from Sweetwater. So uh, my, my goal is to have my video of the Spark versus the Yamaha up before Sweetwater has it or in time for Sweetwater to have it. So if you go to buy those, maybe that'll be the first video out there that says, hey, okay, here's what I like and don't like about each one. I'm really curious. But the Spark... Um, it's right here. And um, I still use it like every day. It's probably the most used practice amp I've ever used ever. Uh, I still have, if you're curious, I still have my Katana 50. Everybody's asked, yes, it's, I do. It's downstairs. Uh, I'm not keeping it. I, I haven't sold it yet because I don't want to sell it until I know for sure I'm not going to do any comparison videos with it or anything like that. But I have no 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 uh, inkling to keep it because I, I like this I like this much better. If you're gonna use the, the the katana for gigging or playing out, yes. But for home practice, I, I enjoy that. All right, so there you go. Uh, all right, okay. So that's how we end this. All right, guys, thank you. We made it. Now my voice is back. This whole time I've been struggling to keep a voice, and now it's back. Uh, <laughs> So, all right. Uh, I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. I plan to have a fantastic weekend. I will definitely do a video of my uh, Princeton, new Princeton, and comparing it to the old one and telling you guys what I think about those two. Um, and then uh, uh, and uh, somebody's asking me about my settings in the Spark. I will make sure to discuss that when I do the comparison video with the Yamaha and what I use and how I set it up. And as always, guys, I want to thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. Uh, and I put some cool links down below. I talked about the uh, the virtual event with Tyler Larson. Please check that out. If you guys coming up in August, if you guys want to do that, it's very cool. And as always, thank you so much for your time. To the next time, I guess I'll say uh, know your gear. <laughs> <laughs>